Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Ashley Batts Allen, Associate Dean of Faculty and Research in the College of Arts and Sciences at UNC Pembroke. I am also a social psychologist by training with research in self compassion and its impact on trauma. It is truly an honor to welcome you to UNCP's fifth annual human trafficking conference. There are over 400 registered attendees, which is incredibly impressive. So we thank you for your sincere interest in learning about this terrible crime. As a bit of history and backstory, Judy Paparossi has taught human trafficking and slavery at UNCP since 2010, but it was one of her students who brought the idea of hosting an annual conference to the forefront. Throughout the years, Professor Paparossi has brought in a wide variety of experts to the university in an effort to make our students and the public aware of the dangers of human trafficking. Those experts include federal and state legislators, members of law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, Homeland Security, uh, the Wilmington Police Department, the New Hanover County Sheriff's Office, the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation. Uh, there have also been assistant district attorneys, members of wonderful non-governmental organizations who work to support and aid our survivors, um, places like Wilmington's A Safe Place, uh, members of academia, members of the North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission and the North Carolina Coalition Against Human Trafficking, but most importantly, survivors of human trafficking whose contribution to fighting this crime has been the greatest resource for all of us. And for the fifth conference in a row, Bill Wolf, retired detective from Virginia and the 2018 recipient of the Presidential Award for Extraordinary Efforts to Combat Trafficking in Persons, will be here again in his role as the founder of Anti-Trafficking International, a non-governmental organization whose mission is to abolish human trafficking in our communities and businesses through education, prevention, and intervention. Anti-Trafficking International targets this threat from five different angles, youth prevention education, community empowerment, professional training, parent support, and student leadership. He will be joined by a staff member, Barbara Amea. Several of our students and graduates of UNCP have volunteered with Bill over the years to continue the fight against human trafficking. Finally, UNCP is honored for the second time to share video presentation from Congressman Chris Smith, the author of the landmark legislation protecting trafficking victims and recognizing human trafficking as a crime called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000. He also wrote and sponsored the International Megan's Law to prevent demand for child sex trafficking and the Frederick Douglass Trafficking Victims Prevention and Protection Act. I now will turn it over to Judy Paparossi, who is responsible for making this happen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Allen. I really appreciate it. And I welcome you all. I know a lot of you are going to be watching this on recordings uh, with your agencies at a different time. So I welcome you, even though you're not here live today, you're all so important to all of us here at UNC Pembroke. We work very hard to try to get this message out to all of you about human trafficking. Just very quickly, I'm going to share today's agenda so you have an idea what's going on very quickly. So, of course, the welcome was by Dr. Uh, Dr. Allen just now. I'm going to be welcoming you and talking for just a few minutes. We will then jump into Congressman Chris Smith's nine minute video. Then I'll introduce our keynote speaker, who I'm so proud to know for so many years. She's been at every one of these and she was supposed to co host a couple of years ago, but COVID got us. Uh, Chris, Christine Long, who's the executive director of the North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission. And then the rest of my honored guest speakers include Bill Wolf, who we'll talk about. The, uh, Dr. Allen just mentioned him. He's the founder of Anti-Trafficking International. And probably the most powerful thing today, despite the fact that I have the greatest speakers in the world, we'll be hearing from Barbara Amaya, uh, who is a, going to give the survivor response. So Bill will give the Christine will give the North Carolina response to what's happened over the last 20 plus years that we've been fighting human trafficking. Bill will give the non-governmental non organization or what I call the NGO response. Barbara will give probably the most pivotal and important testimony today, her survivor leadership at an anti-trafficking international. She has quite the story. Then we'll, if, if we have time, we'll take a break and then we'll get to the law enforcement response a, a tag team from the New Hanover County Sheriff's Department, Chief Deputy Kenneth Sarvis and Detective Will Campbell. Will is boots on the ground human trafficking 
And Ken Sarvis is going to be a graduate of UNC Pembroke in May, but he's chief deputy of the sheriff's department here in New York County, a wonderful guy. And then we have this awesome colleague. Um, she and I just are so devoted to this topic. Dr. Veronica Hardy is a professor of social work. And then finally, uh, the, we're going to have a European response. We have a visitor from Poland, um, and he's been helping with some of the Ukrainian families. Professor Maciek Bernashevitz from the University of Silesia. He will be talking about the what's what Europe's response will be. Okay, so here are my opening remarks. And Durant, I'm only seeing your screen. I'm not seeing anything else. I'm just seeing you, just you and no one else at this point. So could we fix that? Um, it, maybe it's going to have to be after the congressman's video. So I welcome you again. I especially welcome the public and my former students and all of you for caring enough to spend some time with us at UNC Pembroke at this at our first virtual conference. And I do apologize for the two year delay uh, of the hiatus because of COVID. The presenters and I really applaud your interest and passion in learning about what I refer to as the worst crime I have ever seen. I spent 31 years working in criminal justice. As a prosecutor, I worked in prisons, I worked in probation, I worked in parole, I worked with the police for many years. As a prosecutor, I actually worked in a police station for about 12 years. And this is the worst crime I've ever seen because it literally combines all crimes. But it's meteoric growth in the past two decades, which is why our topic today, the topic of our conference is 20 plus years later, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and continued fight against human trafficking in the world today. It it's, has stunned even those of us who worked in law enforcement for many years. It has stunned us, especially in America, but all over the world, the meteoric rise of human trafficking going from when I was a prosecutor in the, in the 80s and 90s in New Jersey, we, we never even talked about slavery, and now it's either the number two or number three, I believe it's number two, crime in the world with 20 million slaves. How could that possibly be we abolish slavery? In a minute, you'll hear from Congressman Chris Smith. But for Chris Smith, who discovered this problem in the 90s, long before I even heard about it, most and many of us even heard about it, he wrote the first federal legislation and got it passed into law called, called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. He has authored all the other laws. Some You have to get laws reauthorized. So basically he's authored, sponsored, or co-sponsored five major pieces of legislation on human trafficking. And now I believe he's going after another one, and he'll talk about that in a minute. He is the co-chairman of the Congressional Human Trafficking Caucus. A caucus is like a working group within Congress. And as horrified as we all have been over the years about commercial human trafficking, especially domestic minor human uh, sex trafficking, there's also this enormous problem of labor trafficking of children, children who are making, uh, cutting cacao plants down in the Congo or in a Cote d'Ivoire in Africa. They're children. They're not going to have chocolate on Easter. They're not going to have anything because they're slaves. And it's really important that all of us take a look at what's going on that we can do something about. Maybe only law enforcement can stop labor tra uh, sex trafficking, but we can stop buying products like Hershey's candy bars and kisses because Hershey's promised 15 years ago to be fair trade, but children are still working as slaves. And if you have any doubt what I'm talking about, research it, the dark side of chocolate. Um, the Thai fishing industry is killing people, killing slaves. Our computers are filled with materials that children, slaves, harvest, tin, tungsten, cobalt, diamond rings, diamond mines, they send children in to get this. If you doubt me, please take my course. Please understand that this is a major problem. But the good news, the great news is that there are products that are certified fair trade. I don't know if you can see it, I'm putting it up here, but there are fair trade products. This is called Honest Tea. It is now fair trade. This chocolate bar, I got all this at Harris Teeter, but you can get it at Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's works really hard. You'll see right here in the corner, this is fair trade certified. Excuse me, I don't know if you can see it. I'm getting bl blanked out a little bit, but Alter Echo has fair trade chocolate and it's delicious. 
And this big bar is like $2. So a Hershey bar is like a dollar and a half. I also found Zevia iced tea. This is also fair trade. I went into a fair trade store in Florida. I love turquoise because I used to live in the Southwest. I got turquoise earrings. This is made in India or somewhere. I think this was India. Uh, these women make these fair trade bracelets. And as a result, they don't have to work as slaves. They don't have to sell their children into slavery. So there's a lot of good news out there. We're going to give you bad news, but we're also going to give you really good news. There's a lot you can do. So think fair trade and make sure it's fair trade certified. So, you know, you see a lot of labels on organic things, but sugar is harvested by children, slaves. So you have to make sure the entire product gets that fair trade certification. Okay. So I'm honored now to present uh, uh, this, uh, the second video from Congressman Chris Smith, as who, whom I said, wrote all this wonderful uh, anti-trafficking legislation at the federal level that not only helps victims, helps education, helps law enforcement. It's has, it, it, there's a worldwide response from our laws. So if some country like North Korea is pushing like its dictator does, he's actually a human trafficker himself, Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong if he's pushing human trafficking, we penalize that country. We penalize them financially. So th there's there's teeth in the laws that Congressman Smith and other others in Congress have passed. And just remember this one thing, which you hear a lot in uh, our classes, in our talks. You can sell a gun once. You can sell a drug once. But think how often you can sell a child victim of domestic sex trafficking 20, 30 times a day. That's the difference. There's low startup costs for human trafficking, high profits, and a low risk of prosecution. So it's really important that we get educated about this topic. And here is the video from Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Judy, for your extraordinary leadership and deep concern for the victims of human sex and labor trafficking, and for the invitation to join the fifth annual Human Trafficking Conference at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. I am honored to be invited back to provide an overview of anti-trafficking efforts and update my work on the Frederick Douglass Trafficking Victims Prevention and Protection Act of 2022. I would also like to extend my gratitude to Dr. Robin Cummins, Dean Richard Yeh, Associate Dean Ashley Allen, and Dr. John Lillis of the Sociology and Criminal Justice Department for helping to put together this very important conference. During this 20 plus years later conference, I would like to share a brief history of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 as the law's prime author. I actually began working on combating human trafficking back in the mid 1990s, indeed with legislation I introduced in 1995 that went on to be passed by the House but not the Senate to combat child labor and especially after meeting and listening to survivors. Survivors are the real experts, as we all know. Their lived experiences and their perspectives can help inform our policies and our legislation and make them far more effective than they otherwise would be. Through a survivor-informed approach, we build effective victim-centered and trauma-informed anti-trafficking strategies. I introduced the first legislation in the United States to address human trafficking, uh, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, more than 20 years ago, though it is hard to believe now, my legislation was met with a wall of skepticism and outright opposition, dismissed by many as a solution in search of a problem. For most people at that time, including lawmakers, the term trafficking applied almost exclusively to drugs and weapons, not human beings. Reports of vulnerable persons, especially women and children, being reduced to commodities for sale were often met with surprise, incredulity, or indifference. Top officials in the Clinton administration testified against major provisions of my bill at congressional hearings that I chaired and said, for example, that naming, shaming, and above all, sanctioning countries with egregiously poor records on human trafficking, including and especially government complicity, would somehow be counterproductive. We did overcome the naysayers. We persisted. It was bipartisan. And as a matter of fact, though, when my bill was stalled and languishing and presumed dead, I brought two victims of sex trafficking that my wife Marie and I had met in 1999 
in St. Petersburg, Russia, to tell their stories. They were incredibly courageous and candid, describing the daily abuse and horror that they had endured. Nevertheless, it took over two years to muster the votes for passage, and my bill was finally signed into law on October 28, 2000. When it was finally signed into law, it created a new whole of government domestic and international strategy and established many, many new programs to protect victims, prosecute traffickers, and to the extent possible, prevent it all in the first place, what we now call the three Ps. <clears throat> Within a year after enactment, no one was arguing anymore that the Trafficking Victims Protection Act's integrated three P strategy was flawed, unworkable, unnecessary, or counterproductive. The Trafficking Victims Protection Act, including a number of sea change criminal code reforms, including treating as a victim of trafficking and not a perpetrator of a crime, anybody who was recruited, harbored, transported, or obtained for the purpose of a commercial sex act or for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subject subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. As the years have passed, we have had to update the TVPA, taking into account what we have learned. Over the years, I've authored four additional laws to combat human trafficking, including in 2003, 2005, 2016, and 2019. And without diminishing in any way the focus on the cruelty of sex trafficking, expanded attention has been paid to labor trafficking and its presence in our supply chains, particularly with an eye to the current forced labor camps and genocide of Uyghur Muslims and other in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in China. The 2003 reauthorization, just for an example, included a provision that increasingly is increasingly relevant to current supply chain issues. The provision directed the President of the United States to, in, quote, ensure that any federal grant, contract, or cooperative agreement shall include a condition that authorizes the federal department or agency involved to terminate the grant, contract, or agreement without any penalty to the government if the grantee or any subgrantee of the contract is involved with human trafficking. Of course, people could be prosecuted for this, but it also means they will lose business. This means that every contract contains a due diligence provision that requires top management of a corporation to literally sign on the bottom line that they understand that if they're selling a product to the U.S. government and are complicit in human trafficking, we can take away that contract and we'll take it away. It really puts a light on the fact that not only will people be held criminally liable, but they will also lose business. Since the U.S. federal government is the single largest consumer in the world, the United States needs to make sure that we're not complicit unwittingly or in any other way with human trafficking. Most recently, I have been working on the 2022 reauthorization of the TVPA. This February, I introduced the Frederick Douglass Trafficking Victims Prevention and Protection Act of 2022, the bill which I co-authored with Congresswoman Karen Bass of California, and which was informed again by survivor input, strengthens and expands U.S. anti-trafficking programs. It ramps up prevention and protection efforts against trafficking of children, and it adds government accountability to anti-trafficking training and policies through our travel partnerships with hotels. It also includes survivor empowerment uh, approach with wraparound social services, case management, mental health care, life skills training, and employment and education assistance. The bill enhances a number of successful programs, like grants for preventing child trafficking by adding prevention of online grooming and trafficking of children through sustainable age-appropriate trauma-informed approaches, and scalable programs that use proven and test, tested uh, best practices. It also strengthens law to prevent, identify, and report child sex and labor trafficking. The Frederick Douglass TV PRA will authorize approximately a billion dollars over five years for programs at the Department of Health and Human Services, Justice, Homeland Security, and State to combat human trafficking and above all to support victims. 
It has already passed the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. We are currently pushing very hard to get this bill directly to the floor. And again, I can't thank you enough for your interest and your commitment, all of you who are listening to this, uh, in combating human trafficking. Modern day slavery must end and it must not end now. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Congressman Smith. And we're gonna go right to our keynote now, Christine Long. Christine came to my first 2015 conference brought by one of my students, Susan Romano. I believe Susan was there that, I mean, I know Susan was there. I don't know if you were with her at that point. And uh, just became instant friends with Christine. She, uh, Christine is an MSW. She has attended all of our conferences. Thank you, Christine, I appreciate it. And she was supposed to be our 2020, as I said, keynote, but COVID happened. And so we know what happened there. She is currently the executive director of the North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission, where she strives to improve our statewide response here in North Carolina and collaboration to identify and respond to human trafficking issues here in our state. Previously, she was with the Salvation Army um, of Wake County, and as its director of social ministries, she oversaw program operations at the Wake County Center of Hope with a 90 bed shelter for women with children experience homelessness. And remember homelessness may lead to human trafficking, which is one of the major issues in Ukraine right now. Luckily, the, Pol the Polish people, and we have a professor here today from Poland, um, Maciej will be speaking towards the end of the conference. But the human traffickers know right now that there are a lot of vulnerable women and children because the men had to stay behind to fight in Ukraine a lot of vulnerable men and uh, women and children in going into different countries, especially Poland, and they're gonna go too. The traffickers are gonna follow them. So Christine addressed homelessness years ago and she opened Project FIGHT. FIGHT stands for Freeing Individuals Gripped by Human Trafficking. Project FIGHT responded to hundreds of referrals across the state of North Carolina and is now located in six cities. She has served even before, or she served four years on the North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission, on the Salvation Army's North American Anti-Human Trafficking Council. In 2017, proudly, she was presented with the National Salvation Army's Excellence in Social Work Award. However, she's from ECU and not from UNCP, but we can forgive her for that, okay? She got her uh, undergraduate and her master's in social work from ECU. So please welcome our keynote speaker today, Executive Director of North Carolina's Human Trafficking Commission, Christine Long, with North Carolina's response to human trafficking. Welcome, Christine. Hold on. Hey, I think that worked. Am I unmuted? Great. Perfect. Great. Thank you all so much and good morning. Thank you for starting your day with us and for coming and learning about this topic. Um, and thank you to um, Dr. Judy and UNC Pembroke for hosting this and being so diligent about it every year. Um, it definitely is needed and makes an impact. So I am going to share my screen here and try to keep my cursor in the right place. Okay, is that working? Perfectly. Okay, terrific. Well, so I wanted to start um, in looking back at it. You know, I do want to do a take a look back over the last really 22 years since we've now had COVID um, since the TVPA and let kind of bring everyone up to speed on all of the enormous progress that's been made. There's still progress that needs to be made. Um, but I wanted to start first with just the most common stat that people find if they were to Google human trafficking in North Carolina or a lot of our media reports across the state. Find this particular stat and use it and there are there are great reasons for that um, Polaris project also known as the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. They have a national human trafficking hotline as well as a very in depth website with lots of resources and information. Um, but their hotline does serve as a wonderful resource for us across the state and other states 
um, for survivors and victims, service providers, community members to call for information. And so their stats are based on the particular calls made to them. And so North Carolina has always, um, well, has consistently ranked within the top 10 states um, for calls to their hotline. Um, we are in, in their last stats issued, which was 2020, um, we were ninth in the nation. Um, and it gives you some of the breakdown of, of all the calls they've gotten from North Carolina, the data analysis they're able to do on potential actual trafficking cases. That, and so this breaks that down for you a little bit. Um, and that, like I said, the media does often cite this, um, but the important thing to remember with these stats and these numbers is it is based off calls to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. So you have to know what human trafficking is and you have to know a hotline is there and need a resource to call it. So in reality, when we talk to service providers across the state and others, and some of them get calls from the National Hotline, some of them don't, but the ones that get the calls um, tell us that Polaris is about 10 to 15% of their cases. And so in reality, we know that this is just a fraction of the cases being identified across our state. And since human trafficking is a hidden crime, and we are still, after 20 years, um, only skimming the surface with identification, um, we, we know that there is a lot more happening across our state. And we have been able to learn quite a bit that we'll share and you'll learn throughout today's um, conference. But, um, so what I wanted to say about these stats is that we actually look at our ranking as ninth in the nation as a good thing. And the reason we do that is because um, it means that we are doing a good job raising awareness about human trafficking, getting this hotline number out there, and we are dry, helping to drive as a state calls to it. And so that's a good thing for us. Um, and we... Um, we like, we like to just kind of word it in that way. Um, the other thing I will tell you about Polaris and the National Hotline is if you are somebody that likes to research and look into things, they have a wonderful resource center um, that gives lots of information and safety plans. And But um, they also have some publications. And so if you're interested, they do have a terrific publication that's a few years old now, but it's about the typologies of modern human trafficking. And so... Um, that report will talk about, you know, what labor trafficking within the restaurant industry looks like, or the banging and panhandling industry, or nail salons, all of which we've had situations and cases in North Carolina through. Um, it also goes into the breakdown of um, what sex trafficking looks like in different industries and scenarios. And so um, all of those industries in the report are still really relevant. We, of course, continue to learn about new ones um, that um, that aren't in the report, but the report is terrific to look at. Um, and I will say, you know, the report does talk about, you know, how maybe sex trafficking within the pornography industry looks. Um, and that's a definite area since COVID that we have seen increases all across the state in with, with trafficking. So that's not, unfortunately, not a trend we think will probably decrease anytime soon. But what I am going to talk about um, today is kind of three different areas. Um, looking at, since the TVPA passed, laws and policies um, that have happened and largely in the early years, that is what the focus was in North Carolina. And then how both TVPA and the policies in North Carolina and laws have created some system change across the years. And then just a short um, ending with you know, moving forward in the short term, what we're looking at. So, um, let's see. I'm going to see if I can. There we go. And I shared the Polaris hotline, Christine, because I memorized it years ago. Terrific. Oh, thank you. Yep. And it is at the end as well. So, great. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, okay. So, in looking at key le legislation, while well, the TVPA passed in 2000, um, of course, at that time period, there were no state laws related to human trafficking. And so our state laws were created in 20, 2006. And so um, I've had, I've talked to lots of just legal e experts over the years who have said that our law is, is really, it really closely mirrors the federal law. There's a little key differences, um, but that, you know, in, in reality, 
um, there were many states that didn't have laws until recently on human trafficking. So North Carolina was ahead there. In 2007, they passed a law that added some protections for victims because what was happening, of course, in 2006, right, is realizing what human trafficking was and starting to realize this potential that, that um, there are victims and that people we may not have been treating as victims before could be victims. And so there was lots of question back then about you know, smuggling and human trafficking or prostitution versus human trafficking. And there was still some hesitation there in how things should be approached. And so this 2007 law was just addressing a little bit of, you know what, there are victims involved in this and we should be doing some things differently for them. Um, in 2012, that's when the General Assembly created the North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission, which I work for. Um, it was initially created as an exploratory commission and then in 2013 was solidified as a permanent entity um, and, and was at that time and for a number of years actually not given any operating funding, just wasn't able to appropriate funding that recurred in the budget. And so the commissioners themselves really were the ones digging in and doing the work the first several years. Um, to tell you a little bit more about the commission, um, the General Assembly established some statutory charges. There are actually seven, but the seventh has been accomplished and we'll talk about here in a minute. But these charges give you an idea about what the commission is kind of being asked to oversee and do. And so, um, you know, the General Assembly in creating the commission really made it the mandatory leader of the state. Um, some states have task forces. We hope to have a task force here on a statewide level. Um, some have councils or a few have commissions like us, but, but states that are doing the most with human trafficking tend to have some sort of um, mandatory lead across the state. So, um, so this gives you an idea here of the general things that the commission is charged with and works within since 2013. And this slide gives you an idea of who our appointed commissioners are because um, we do have 15 commissioners and they are appointed um, four by the governor, four by the Senate, four by the House here, and then three that are judicial branch appointments. And so um, these are the, the ones who kind of things are brought to and vote and make some of the decisions and do a lot of the hard work. Um, we try to have the commission be balanced between government and nonprofits, between different um, disciplines such as law enforcement or service providers or experts in certain areas. Um, so this slide tells you a little bit about that. Um, we have received some funding over the past few years that have allowed us to, to have uh, myself and other staff at different times. And then this year we're, we were granted a recurring money that will staff the commission from now on. So, um, so this tells you a little bit about that commission. And then I want to jump back to the laws um, because 2013 was actually a big year where the commission was um, established permanently, but also we had the next piece of legislation from since the TVPA that really um, kind of helped ignite the movement um, in North Carolina, and that's the Safe Harbor Law in 2013. And so um, if you remember when I talked about how in the initial days, people were still trying to figure out these differences in prostitution and trafficking or um, smuggling and trafficking. And in 2013, the Safe Harbor Law really addressed some of those issues and really took a stance about victims and not arresting victims. And, you know, prior, prior to 2013, we were seeing minors get arrested and charged with prostitution. And in reality, um, the trafficking, the definition of human trafficking, if you are under the age of 18 and involved in any commercial sex act, that's human trafficking. And so it, it, you're a victim, um, you're, you're not a perpetrator. And so Safe Harbor immediately ended that practice of arresting or charging minors. And it also did some other um, really good things too. Um, it it um, made mistake of age, can't be a defense. So if you're a buyer or a trafficker and you say that, you know, this person told you they were 18 and they, you know, and they weren't, you can't use that as a defense in, in trial or in court. Um, consent of a minor is not a defense because a minor cannot consent. Um, it also holds businesses accountable to some degree. If you have maybe a landlord who's renting to someone and he knows that it's a brothel, 
um, or a hotel that's renting rooms to someone they know that is a pimp, um, there are avenues that can hold those businesses liable. And so the safe harbor law, um, the last thing that I should say that it did was the, the seventh charge of the commission was to explore whether or not um, traffickers, convicted traffickers, should be required to register as sex offenders. And so the safe harbor law made that happen and um, got that done in 2013. And so um, really, I, I at that time was a service provider and was involved in the movement of human trafficking. But I will tell you that it, it felt like it just changed everything when the safe harbor law passed. And, you know, you would immediately have calls from law enforcement that say, you know, hey, you know, we have this 17 year old or this 15 year old and the district attorney is telling us that um, she's a victim uh, or he's a victim and um, you might be able to help. And so it really started off these kind of it, multidisciplinary talks that had, had been happening to some extent, but really started taking off at that point. Um, in 2014, um, there was some studies mandated to look at child sexual abuse and sex trafficking. 2015, um, you see here that boards of education were required to receive training on, on trafficking. 2016 was a year that we looked at mandatory training um, for law enforcement. And so right now, basic law enforcement training across the state has two hours of human trafficking training um, that's about to change to four hours, actually. And then there's a number of different um, courses that law enforcement can take as well. Um, 2017, and when I talked about that typologies report with, with Polaris and the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, um, massage industry is one of the industries where trafficking ha can happen and, and does happen in North Carolina. So, so in 2017, some loopholes were closed by amending some of the massage laws in North Carolina. So already you're kind of seeing that a lot of just movement through policies and laws um, what were happening in these initial years. Um, in 2017, we were able to get um, a mandatory um, human trafficking awareness poster um, established. And so um, on the slide here, these are places that have to post this poster across the state. Um, it's about 25,000 locations. Um, we have this poster in different languages. And we have also had just a terrific response from businesses and companies. I got an email yesterday from someone that wants one in Chinese. And so um, we've seen this poster be used pretty widely across the state. And the purpose is really to get it up in places that victims, survivors, and others might see it and then might be able to call or text for help and assistance. And so um, let's see. Um, to continue about key legislation, um, you'll see here some of these lines are purple, and that distinguishes legislation that the commission kind of launched or um, took on a heavy part of, where there's other legislation that has passed throughout the years that we've supported, and some that we didn't even know was happening. Um, and so um, this, this gives you a few more examples. In 2017, the State Bureau of Investigation was given jurisdiction over trafficking. Um, I have a little bit more about them later on in this. Um, in 2018, we were appropriated some victim services money that we were able to grant out. Um, in 2018, we took a look at making sure that victims are awarded restitution after any conviction in the state happens. Um, in 2018, um, a, policy, a, a law passed making mandatory education in schools. Um, a law, uh, most of the time we're seeing that in seventh grade happening for sex trafficking education. Um, there were also some major child welfare policy changes in 2018, um, changes that um, actually make it mandatory. If, if someone calls in a report of a um, minor that they believe or suspect to be human trafficking, that is an automatic investigation that has to be launched from that. So child welfare has to go out, has to investigate and determine if, um, if that's happening. So. Um, so that was a big one too. Um, in 2019, we were able to create a civil cause of action. So, um, you know, there is a criminal route to go after um, traffickers, but this civil cause of action allows for victims to actually sue entities and, and have a civil route to receive remedies. Um, we also were able to really, really expand our expunction laws um, 
in North Carolina. And so if you, um, which we often see is that victims of human trafficking, while they're being trafficked, um, they're forced to commit other crimes as well. So they might have a breaking and entering charge, a shoplifting charge, drug related charges, all sorts of things that happen because they were being trafficked. And so we now have a route to expunge those for victim survivors um, when convictions have been made and, and in other situations. Um, so you see here 2021, um, the age of the North Carolina marriage um, law was changed. Believe it or not, North Carolina was one of the only states in the nation. I think we were, there were two states in the nation. Um, North Carolina was one of those that allowed marriage at 14. Um, and so you can imagine the types of trafficking situations that might happen um, in, in that age. Um, we pushed and pushed um, and pushed um, as a state to try to get that to 18. And in the end, it was a compromise that passed that now the legal age of marriage is 16 in North Carolina, but with that allowance that they would only be able to marry someone that's up to four years older than them, right? Because what we were seeing happening is um, 15, 16 year olds marrying people 10, 15, 20 years older than them, which by law is statutory rape. Um, and so um, this has closed another bit of loophole in North Carolina. Um, this in 2021, um, the State Bureau was actually given, and we're very excited about this, eight dedicated human trafficking positions. And so where they have jurisdiction over human trafficking, um, now they will have eight dedicated positions to address, look into, help organize the state efforts with investigations in, in North Carolina. And then the commission as well was given regular operating funds, and we were, we've been given about eight million in direct service money for human trafficking for um, nonprofits that we're working diligently on now. So um, what I will say with all of this is that um, looking back for us um, in what must have happened in 2006, um, but I was not a part of actually. And then in 2013, um, Safe Harbor was not the easiest thing to get through the General Assembly. It did take quite a bit of work and education. But what I can say is over the past five, um, what we have been involved with has gone through almost unanimously every time in the General Assembly. And that really shows that um, we have support to fight human trafficking in the state and that these are bipartisan bills that, that get that support and move through fairly easily. So, um, so where has these um, laws, policies, you know, where have they led us? And really, they have led to a lot of our systems changing. And so that's kind of what I want to move into next. Um, and I have this slide here that I heard recently, actually for what, from one of the writers of our safe harbor law in North Carolina. Um, and sometimes this work feels like we're moving at a sales pace. It feels like that right now, actually. Um, but um, the TVDA, TVPA and the safe harbor and other laws in North Carolina and all the partners that have helped to get this moving, um, we really have gone far together. And so, um, so I like this proverb a lot because I think that it, it, it is a good example of how it has felt in North Carolina um, over the past few years. So I'm gonna hope this next slide. So that same person that, that I heard use this proverb um, recently, um, she previously worked for the North Carolina, I mean, for the Human Trafficking Institute out of DC, and they publish a report every year on federal charges and convictions across the state for human trafficking. And so um, this is actually one of their slides, and um, it shows kind of that 20 year spread of federal charges. Now, remember, not every case goes federal, um, and, and, um, but you will see here that there, there have been some cases. Uh, we are making small progress. There have been some sex trafficking cases, mostly sex trafficking prosecuted, and some forced labor cases as well. Um, now on a state level, um, which the Human Trafficking Institute also helped analyze this data and looked at a four-year period for us, you see here the different charges, of course, an actual human trafficking charge 
involuntary servitude and sexual servitude are both under the human trafficking laws in North Carolina. They're both a form of human trafficking, um, particularly that we look at as labor trafficking, um, but you see these cases here. And now we have 100 counties in North Carolina. These numbers represent about 33 of the counties. Um, so we have work to do in helping other counties um, make charges. Um, there's lots of reasons why we, we may see cases, you know, one, it may take a couple of years for cases to go to trial. Some cases may go federal. Um, some may be pled down to lesser charges. So there's lots of things to work with here in the future and going forward. But we do see progress. Um, 2020, I was actually surprised to see 139 charges in 2020 because many of our courthouses were closed down because of COVID. Um, and many of our law enforcement agencies were scaled way back because of COVID and everything else happening in 2020. So um, the other thing I want to tell you about North Carolina that we are really excited about is that um, we have a, an actual specialty court in Cumberland County in North Carolina in Southernville that is a specialty court focused on human trafficking. And so um, that court has been in operation for a few years now, um, but we are thinking within the next year or so that that may be a model that can spread to some of the other courts in North Carolina. And it has been a terrific model to address um, the cases for human trafficking and the trauma informed and um, help victims as well. So, so that is called the Worth Court in Cumberland County, if anyone wants to look into that. But um, let's see, so the next, um, um, on a statewide basis, um, I have to put this slide first. When we're talking about statewide efforts, training, awareness, advocacy, um, the North Carolina Coalition Against Human Trafficking, some here, um, some just call it NCCAT actually, but um, um, this was actually a grassroots organization way back in the beginning that helped all of these laws come along, helped the commission be established through legislation, and then eventually incorporated to become its own nonprofit. And so there's a couple of great things to know about them and their email address and um, Facebook is on, on the screen here too. But if you are um, interested in this movement, they're a good one to follow and join their efforts because they do put out statewide newsletters and do lots of, of different things. The other terrific thing that they've just launched last year is a survivor network in North Carolina. So as you heard the Congressman say a few minutes ago, survivor input experience stories, um, being a part of the whole process is so important um, to the movement. And because human trafficking is such a broad, broad area, um, we really um, need a lot of survivor leaders at the table to share their different experiences and um, advice and knowledge. And so the Survivor Network has started through NCCAT and is building on that. Um, right now they're offering a peer type support group and um, we expect to see them grow um, in the next year as well. So this is a good agency to look into as a nonprofit or grassroots type effort. Um, another one on a statewide effort is um, North Carolina Stop Human Trafficking. They also do a newsletter on a statewide basis. They do a number of trainings. They their newsletter highlights all the trainings and any recent cases and things like that going on. So they're another one to follow. They're based out of Greenville. Um, and so um, definitely look into those. Um, we could spend time talking about the statewide efforts. The North Carolina Council for Women and Youth Involvement has, has a big program. Um, UNC School of Government um, trains local law enforcement and has, has uh, planned trainings for all levels of that. And then our North Carolina Commission on Indian Affairs has some specialized project, projects on human trafficking for American Indians, and one in particular in the Lumberton area. And um, they have case managers and things as well through that. So, so there are some different statewide efforts, but I wanted to highlight the ones that you could join or be members of or follow the easiest. Um, when we also talk about statewide, we can't leave out prevention, right? Um, that was one of the three keys that was just talked about. So um, there are some different prevention efforts, and this first slide is about um, a demand reduction task force that has been formed um, and has a number of different groups that are a part of it. And you see here their mission and what they are looking at is the demand side of human trafficking and how to reduce that demand, how to tackle that demand. And so um, it includes prevention type information too. So. Um, 
Another prevention one that's good to look at while there are others, I'm sure, I'm sure there's ones we also don't know about, um, but the North Carolina Coalition Against Sexual Assault, um, they have a number of different prevention type um, programs, presentations, materials, a um, couple publications as well. So this one that I have on the screen is a partnership with Justice U, but it's not their only one. They have a few others as well. Um, so we have seen prevention efforts and really these prevention efforts we've really seen established just in the last couple of years. So initially in, in North Carolina, we were really training, raising awareness and trying to figure out our response as a state, you know, how we were going to provide for victims. And so to see it shift to prevention is really um, exciting to see that brought in finally. Um, when we do talk about survivor response, we have a number of nonprofits across the state and different groups. And um, really the commission has a resource directory on our website, and that is the best way to take a look at all the different groups, whether they're local governments or their grassroots efforts and coalitions or their actual their nonprofits that serve victims are all in that directory. Um, and what we're aiming for in North Carolina is to have a response in all of these areas on your screen. And so having people that provide immediate needs, ongoing needs, long-term needs, um, really to truly address human trafficking and provide for victims in a comprehensive, holistic way, um, this is what we need to be working towards. And I can tell you that we have a long way to go. We have a lot more programs than we used to. We have parts of the state covered that we didn't used to, but we still have quite a bit of gaps and quite a bit that needs developed and um, brought kind of up. Um, and so and while we have a lot to do with that, we have seen, of course, over COVID, um, over the last two years, we've seen lots of these nonprofits struggle and some of them close or cut back on what they can do because of funding issues or changes um, related to COVID. So, um, so this survivor response, I know Bill Wolf's gonna talk later about NGOs and everything, but, but this is to tell you that, you know, system-wide, we are seeing regional response grow. We are seeing things, but we, we do have a long way to go in this area. Um, just am watching the time here. Um, so the commission, the other things I wanted to point out is that we do have a resource library on our website. It has handouts for North Carolina um, examples. We have billboards up right now and have done billboard campaigns. Everything that we do is public. And so there are podcasts and videos. There's example social media posts that people can use to raise awareness about trafficking. Um, there's also that directory of resources and there's articles and recommendations about best practices. So that library is there for you as well. You can also um, follow the commission's public meetings and listen into those or um, email us to be on our email list to learn about, about things that we do. Um, one of the main things that we have done um, in the past couple of years is pass standards for direct service providers. Um, and so um, those were just recently revised and we're now working to um, implement those across the state and make sure that programs out there are using the best practices when they're addressing survivors. Um, and so um, our standards um, are up in draft form right now, but will soon be up in the published revised form that we just finished. So those are there. Um, when we look at other things going on um, with the commission, we do provide training and technical assistance to agencies, and we're a small staff of two right now. We, we are hiring and going to be growing, um, but so we often use partners across the state. If we can't provide a specific kind of training, um, we link people to trainers and help get things lined up. So um, we also do editing to materials such as the basic law enforcement training. We just provided some feedback to um, the commission has created a healthcare training and some other specific trainings related to human trafficking um, using healthcare providers in our state that gave examples of what they're seeing and helped um, create that. Um, and then, like I said, connections to other professionals. Um, moving forward in North Carolina, we still have a lot to do, even though we have come um, so very far. Um, and this presentation helps me realize just how far we have come. You know, sometimes it feels like everyone's in their own boat and they're rowing in their own direction. Um, uh, and that, but you know, we really, when you look at this and you look at the, the monumental efforts it had to take everyone coming together to accomplish what's happened over the last 20 years, 
we really are starting to row in the same direction and we want to continue that. And so we hope to um, work with providers across the state, our statewide leaders to implement, to create a strategic plan that even if it's, you know, the next three to five years that we have an actual plan for moving forward, um, you know, continue improving our laws and training and technical assistance. Um, we hope to bring on in the next six months or so um, a housing certification program for people that are housing survivors and victims. Um, our Justice Academy is working on a human trafficking investigator certificate program right now. Um, and then we do an annual statewide conference. Um, and so we are having that in September uh, here in Raleigh. And it, it often brings in, you know, actually we did one last year that, that we did have 250 people come for. So, um, so we're looking forward to that um, conference. And then this year, um, you see my contact information, but once again, if you Google the Human Trafficking Commission, you'll find us and can find our contacts there. And that National Human Trafficking Resource Center here as well. Um, and that actually wraps up my presentation, unless, um, Judy, you have questions you want me to take on or? Because I just have one question because we're gonna kind of stay on time. And you said in 2000, I think it was 2017 or 18, it was mandated by the state legislature and have written into the um, educational law that there be at least two hours a year of training for students. And as I understand it, it's never been funded. You just comment on that briefly before we go to Bill. I can, yes, thank you actually for pointing that out. Um, this was one of those laws. Honestly, if you would have asked us if that would have gone through, we didn't think that it would. Um, and another group um, worked with it and got it in, and we had we did not know that was in there. Um, but when it went through, it went through very easily with full support. Um, and the two hours is specified for child abuse and sex trafficking training. And so it leaves kind of a lot open. It also doesn't um, recommend any particular curriculum. So we've seen counties, um, you know, make make their own, do their own research, create their own curriculum. We've seen that. And so it is one of the things on our list to try to look at because there's some terrific material out there that can be used. Um, and then, of course, yeah, states, um, I mean, counties across the state school boards um, need need help with that. So some some funding to back that up, some recommended um, curriculums would be terrific and um, we have a group that's potentially looking at this in the coming year and going to try to do some evaluation on some different ones and bring forth maybe five or six for the commission to recommend and then we can take that um, forward and see if we can just improve that statute a bit so well luckily we have the next speaker who does it in virginia <laughs> Thank you so much, Christine. I learned so much. I always learned so much from you. And you, honestly, we do have a lot of work to do, but boy, things have changed and things have gone in the right direction. Thanks to your leadership, especially. Thank, Thank you so much. Okay, so the next hour is going to be Bill Wolf, who is the founder of Anti-Trafficking International and Barbara Amaya, who is an advocate and author and a survivor. And they're both working at an NGO called Anti-Trafficking International. Oh, so let me start with Bill. Bill, I've got to pop up here somewhere. You ready? I don't, um, Good morning. Good Can morning. Okay, start your video. All right, I will work on fun. that while you're. Okay, I'm gonna introduce you, but yeah, I can't see your handsome face. Working so, on it. <laughs> for the last five conference, including this one, it actually would have been six, Bill has either appeared in person most of the time. He's come to Wilmington PD, the New Hampshire Sheriff's Office. He's trained. He is Mr. Anti-Human Trafficking International, as far as I'm concerned, he and Chris Smith. Bill has dedicated his professional and personal life to combating human trafficking. He even was awarded in 2018 the presidential, and I mean as in President of the United States, the Presidential Medal for Extraordinary Efforts to Combat Trafficking in Persons. But first and foremost, he was a cop, and that's when I met him. I met him in 2015, thanks to Lindsay Robertson. I think Christine Long was kind of re maybe referring to her a few minutes ago. 
She was an ADA here in North Carolina, helped to write those safe harbor laws that Christine mentioned. But he started out as a police officer, became a detective in Fairfax County, Virginia, and he got into the gangs unit. And it's interesting because I was in the narcotics unit when I was a prosecutor. When he was in the gang unit, he discovered something very incredible. He discovered that gangs like MS-13 were transitioning from crimes like drug trafficking, which you need money for and it's dangerous, and gun trafficking, to human trafficking. And he kind of stumbled into this, much like I stumbled into teaching this course at UNC Pembroke, because as I mentioned earlier, I had never heard of human trafficking except um, you know, a century ago and something before World War II, they used to refer to as white slavery. And Bill found that uh, with the high profits that they were making in human trafficking, especially sex trafficking, the very low risk of prosecution, which Bill will probably address, and the low startup costs that a lot of gangs were actually moving in the direction of human trafficking. So from that point on, and he is a father of six children, count them, six. And from that point on, he knew to protect the children of this country, he had to combat human trafficking. So he was on a federal task force officer investigating and prosecuting both locally and federally these human trafficking cases. He got funding for this task force. He was placed in charge. He coordinated efforts city, local, the, lo the local and the state and regional and federal a law enforcement to work on this. But he also turned and looked at what the NGOs, those non-governmental organizations were doing, because, because you, can, you can rescue a victim from human trafficking, but then what? This victim is different. And I worked with victims for over 20 years. This is a very different victim. And they needed something that our therapeutic community wasn't really prepared for. We're prepared for a girl who gets raped once. We get her into counseling. What do you do with a girl who's been raped thousands of times as a victim of domestic sex trafficking, especially minors? So Bill partnered with NGOs, and under his leadership, the task force identified 217 victims of sex and labor trafficking and recovered 126 victims. God bless. Unbelievable. And in 2019, at our last conference, Bill brought in a sur several survival, a survivor, of Susan Young. Her daughter was trafficked by MS-13, and it was Bill Wolf who, who rescued her daughter from the horrendous, horrendous abuse that she went through as a victim of MS-13 and its human trafficking ring. As I mentioned, Bill, as a father of six, realized that so many young victims were being tricked into human trafficking. And so he founded his own NGO, Just Ask Prevention Project, in order to better help our community and our children um, understand what this, what's going on and where is it going on? It's going on online. It's going on in many places, but the access that criminals have to our children via, uh, via our phones especially, but the online social media has really impacted this meteoric rise of human trafficking. And Bill and his colleagues, hi Bill, nice to see you. Uh, develop a systematic approach of education, prevention, intervention, et cetera, so he can address the threat of human trafficking in our communities. So, and then he decided to retire from law enforcement after 15 years and dedicate his life to this, which was an incredible thing. And he became the, the executive director of that NGO, Just As Prevention, and the director of National Human Trafficking Intelligence Center. But then the White House and the Department of Justice called Bill because we needed his expertise at the top, and he worked as the senior executive in the senior executive service in the role of human trafficking programs director for human for the Department of Justice. He oversaw all of the human trafficking programs across the United States. He became a special advisor to the White House in the previous administration. He was asked to be the acting director of the Office of Victims for Victims of Crime and continue to serve as a principal deputy director. He also, like I am, an adjunct professor, but not a Pembroke at George Mason University and Mount Aloysius College, teaching human trafficking. Oh, did I mention he's also a pilot and he flies his kids up there? <laughs> You're, you have so much courage, Bill. Anyway, you have been my greatest mentor in this area, and I'm so happy to call you my, one of my best friends ever. I love you so much. And I welcome my dear friend, Bill Wolf, to UNC Pembroke's fifth annual human trafficking conference for the fifth time.
Thanks, well, Bill. thank you so much, Judy. Uh, you give me way too much credit, uh, but um, you know, it, it really is, it, it's nothing that, that I've done or any individual has done. It's all about uh, who we surround ourselves with and having such incredible allies like yourself, uh, Christine is, has been an incredible ally, Barbara Amaya, who you all are going to hear from. And of course, Congressman Smith, who is just, I, I can't even say enough about all that he's done uh, in this space. And Judy mentioned, you know, I, I was a police officer and as a police officer, you know, you, you kind of get these, these silos, right? My job is as a police officer is to investigate and uh, hold offenders accountable. And, you know, you really you don't really kind of see the other pieces of the puzzle sometimes. In this human trafficking space, it was something that really allowed me the opportunity to see it's not just law enforcement's problem. Now, law enforcement is critical in combating human trafficking. It is absolutely necessary that law enforcement is engaged okay, I'll do it right in this fight because right offenders now. have to be held accountable. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which you've heard about today, was built on three pillars, right? Uh, uh, prosecution is one of those pillars, and that's holding offenders accountable. It's where law enforcement really comes in. Christine talked a lot about survivor care and having active survivor care, and that's that second P, which is really protection. And then there's that third P, which is prevention. And prevention is something that, unfortunately, uh, we haven't had a lot of focus on. And thanks to, to Congressman Smith in 2018, when the TVPA was to be reauthorized, changed the name to broaden the scope of, uh, of the, the act itself to focus more on prevention. It's so critical. But all of these three things need to work interchangeably through what is sometimes referred to as the fourth P, and that's partnerships. Partnerships are critical in the fight to end human trafficking. There is not one industry, there is not one agency, there is not one person that is responsible for or could be effective in combating human trafficking on their own. And that's really where NGOs come in. They are a critical component that fills so many gaps in the fight to end human trafficking. NGOs can provide for protection of survivors through aftercare or through other programs which are now emerging. Things like jobs empowerment, housing, transitional housing, life skills training, all kinds of things that these incredible NGOs that are in this space are providing for survivors of trafficking. Another area is really in the prevention component of it, really being sure that uh, they can provide uh, adequate prevention programming. As, uh, as Judy mentioned, uh, you know, I'm the proud founder, the proud father, if you will, of uh, Anti-Trafficking International, incredible organization that was started back in 2013 with the goal to really prevent so their tagline is to stop human trafficking before it starts. And I can tell you a lot of that is really drawn from my experiences in this space. Having interviewed several uh, victims of human trafficking, having worked in and having the privilege and honor to work a lot alongside so many survivors, you hear these stories and they're terrible. They're heartbreaking stories. And they're things that no person should ever be subjected to. This is critical. We, we have to make sure that we have a holistic approach. We can't simply be arresting our way out of the problem, right? Important to hold offenders accountable, but we can't simply be arresting our way out of the problem. We can't simply be providing services for survivors of trafficking. Critical. They have to be afforded appropriate services. And we have to make sure that those services are high quality standards, right? Set to industry standards. But we're never going to stop the problem unless we seek to prevent it. And this is an area where government and the public sector or the private sector, the NGOs have to come together. Oftentimes you'll hear this terminology, public-private partnerships, critical in ending 
human trafficking. I was privileged to work for the federal government and part of my role there was to be able to uh, facilitate the drafting of the first national action plan. Now we've come a long way, right? We are more than 20 years into this fight of human trafficking, starting with the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in the year 2000. And a lot of progress has been made. We've learned a lot, but really we've learned a lot about human trafficking because of NGOs. These NGOs are critical for research. They're critical for convening subject matter experts to help us better understand where the challenges are, but also where the gaps are. Where are we missing the picture? I can tell you the response to human trafficking when I first got started about 15 years ago is very different than the response to human trafficking today. I think that the majority of that is truly because NGOs have facilitated that conversation. NGOs are critical in providing aftercare, but they're also critical in research, being thought leaders, driving policy. Policy is an area that I work a lot in now and people say, well, wh what is policy? What, what exactly is it? Well, everything is driven by the idea of what we should be doing right. And that's exactly what policy is. Policy is the ability to put down on paper what should our action plan be? What should the national action plan look like, which is a pretty comprehensive document. And if you haven't looked at it, I encourage you all to, to take a look at it where we really dig into a lot of these critical components, particularly components around going after networks of individuals, going after what is facilitating or allowing the human trafficking to happen in the first place. But also, so we're not just the national action plan, but what Christine is working on has been doing a fantastic job over the past several years in really pulling together that statewide response to human trafficking. North Carolina is consistently considered to be one of the leaders in this fight, and that's because of Christine's leadership and all the amazing work that she is doing. I can tell you that whenever there's a round table or a, a convening of subject matter experts, Christine is always there. And if she's not, her absence is certainly felt. But we have to even be looking down even deeper. We have to understand regionally what is our action plan and locally within our individual communities. What are you doing in your community to prevent, protect, and prosecute? We all play a role throughout the entire process. And really those grassroots efforts, those community-based response plans are really what have the most impact because you all have the most power. People talk about, well, yeah, the, the government has the funding to get it done. Sure, it does. And when I was at the Department of Justice, I oversaw a budget of more than $100 million in, in programming that went out to state and local individuals. But really, that funding is not intended for the federal government to take on those initiatives because the federal government doesn't understand what's happening in your community. The role of the federal government is to provide guidance and support. But that funding is really intended for NGOs, for people that get the problem in their sphere of influence, in their area of responsibility. And that's why that funding is really directed at those individuals. I was privileged to be able to, to work with developing out those programs, to working alongside so many great organizations all across this country. And that work is what is truly driving the successes behind the fight to end human trafficking. This issue is something that unfortunately is not going to go away. So I'm sure you've heard it's the second largest criminal enterprise. The, the bad actors are generating billions of dollars annually in illicit profits. And it's going to take all of us to stand up and respond. It's gonna take good NGOs, good meaning people that are willing to fill gaps that are needed. You heard uh, Judy and Christine talking about prevention education. That's one of the most critical components 
knowing that these traffickers are targeting our young people, younger and younger, what are we doing to protect them? I often say we, uh, I oftentimes uh, will talk about the fact that we, um, you know, we, we teach our kids how to say no uh, to, I'm sorry, to drugs. Why are we not teaching them about human trafficking? While we never say that it's, uh, it's, it's the victim's fault, it certainly is not their fault because they're manipulated into situations. There are things that we can be doing to prevent it. But that's not the role of the government. That's the role of NGOs because NGOs have the flexibility. They have the knowledge. They have the, the, the standing within their communities to be able to advocate for these things. Advocacy is incredibly important. And sometimes I think we forget about the voice that, that NGOs really play in this space. As you have you've talked about, Congressman Smith is, I, I like to talk, call him the godfather of the TVPA. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that publicly, but being the, the original author of the TVPA. And as you may or may not know, that piece of legislation, the principal governing law that covers our, our national response to human trafficking has to be reauthorized every five years. Every five years, Congress has to reconsider that bill and they have to pass legislation to say, yes, this can continue. The Trafficking Victims Protection Act covers critically important components to include the U.S. Advisory Council, which is a council of survivors of human trafficking that advise the president and top officials within the executive branch on response to human trafficking. The TVPA authorizes the criminal codes and the laws like International Megan's Law to prevent bad actors from coming into the United States and warning other countries if offenders are trying to leave our country. The Trafficking Victims Protection Act authorizes, over, it's scheduled to authorize over the next five years, $1 billion in federal funding to address and combat human trafficking. When we're talking about a $9.8 billion industry in the United States, every single penny of that $1 billion counts because we have to counter the offensive of the traffickers. But did you know that the Trafficking Victims Prevention Reauthorization Act is in jeopardy of not passing? Congress is slow rolling it right now over silly political nonsense. This is probably one of the most nonpartisan pieces of legislation to ever go through Congress. How can we change that? How can we ensure that these survivors continue to have a voice in our federal government? How can we ensure that these laws stay in place? How can we ensure that the billion dollars worth of funding is given to NGOs and government to, uh, across the country to continue the fight? The answer is you can. As members of the community, as members of NGOs, you all have a voice. Congress needs to hear from you. Your elected officials need to hear from you so that you know that this is important. Oftentimes we forget how important our voice really is in government, but it is truly we, the people, that drive what happens in our country. Without critical legislation, without the, the work of, of NGOs, without the support of uh, government leaders like Christine, we would be lost and our children would be vulnerable. They would be targeted day in and day out. We're not certain of the exact numbers of victims of human trafficking, but I can tell you from my experience that even one is too many. Even one is worth a billion dollar investment to prevent it from happening again. But we know that the numbers are much greater than that. In fact, the need for housing and, and uh, care facilities, uh, what they oftentimes refer to in the service provider industry as beds, right? We kind of count it as how many beds are available for survivors of trafficking. There are waiting lists all over the country because there's not enough space to provide survivors with the care and treatment that they need. I'm fortunate to work alongside uh, not only Anti-Trafficking International, but several NGOs that are doing amazing work in this space. One in particular, the Safe House Project, is working to ensure that those beds across the country, those programs that are providing services to survivors are of the highest quality. They're gold standard through a certification program. 
that's critical. That's critical because we don't want our survivors going into residential treatment facilities and being given inappropriate services, not being treated with dignity and respect, not being provided with access to care that's going to help them become autonomous and help empower them. Critically important. As I mentioned, the, the, the NGO space, I was very honored uh, representing a coalition of 144 NGOs, over 500 signatories to a letter to Congress that I got to deliver on Monday to congressional representatives, urging the passing of the TVPA without delay, because we have to get this critical legislation passed. It expired last year. So right now we are without any legal standing to be able to continue our efforts to combat human trafficking. I'd encourage all of you to consider learning more about the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, to learn more about reauthorization. You can go to www.safehouseproject.org slash freedom to learn more about this critical bill and to also sign on to the letter because we want that letter to continue to grow so our congressional representatives know how important this is. Each and every one of you has a voice. Each and every one of us has a place. This is not for law enforcement to fix on their own. This is not for uh, the, the courts or for the, you know, the healthcare industry. Everyone plays a role. And those non-governmental organizations, those nonprofit organizations are the glue that holds the entire response together. We need you, we need the NGOs to join this fight to be able to combat human trafficking, human trafficking effectively at the federal, state, and local levels. So I thank you all for your time today. I thank you for your support. And I in particular want to thank all the incredible NGOs that are out there that are doing the necessary work Nonprofit work is not profitable in any sort of way. Maybe that's why they call it nonprofit, right? Uh, but it is very rewarding and it is very necessary. I can tell you in all my years as, as a police officer, uh, you know, kicking in doors and chasing uh, criminals, um, in my time in the government, um, even, even in my time working in, in a high stress environment like the White House, I've never felt more stressed, but more, more rewarded than when I've been working in a governmental organization space. These are the true unsung heroes of our space. These are the individuals that are truly making a difference, that are truly helping in protection, prosecution, and absolutely in prevention. So Judy, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for putting this conference on. Uh, for really helping to bring awareness to all of these various different issues. And if I can ever be of service to any of you, um, especially if you're in the NGO space and, and would like some support, assistance, and guidance, please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you all. Oh, you're on mute, Judy. You're on mute. You're on mute. Bill, uh, we have a little technical issue. Could you stay with us for a few more minutes? Sure, absolutely. Okay, my number one question is I typed www.safehouseproject.org forward slash freedom. Yes, ma'am. So um, that that is uh, safehouseproject.org is an incredible NGO, right? The power of NGOs here. Uh, and they, um, uh, they are really pushing forward in this movement uh, in the ability to, to advocate for the passage of the TVPRA. So one of the things that you can do by going to that website is not just, uh, signing onto the petition, but, um, we were very fortunate to be joined by a representative from Congressman Smith's office and a representative from, uh, Congresswoman Bass, uh, who is the co-sponsor okay. to the reauthorization act. Um, and provided a congressional briefing and a recording of that briefing is available at that website uh, to really learn more about what the what the act actually does and why it's so critical that we get it passed in Congress. Okay, so let's. Uh, I have another question because we have technical difficulties. So sure. Um, 
the TV PRA is what is kind of getting stalled. And the, the TV PA is from 2000. So we're talking the Trafficking Victim Protection Act. But when, you, when they add the R, it needs to be reauthorized, correct? Yeah, so a lot of bills and, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of pieces of legislation have um, what they consider sunset language, meaning that um, Congress intentionally puts this, um, uh, you know, this reauthorization period in there to make sure, and it's a good reason, right? It's to make sure that we're revisiting the legislation every couple of years to make sure that it's still doing what it was originally intended to do. because. As, as I'm sure you has been pointed out to attendees today, over the past 20 years, our knowledge and understanding and response to human trafficking has changed quite considerably. And so that allows uh, the uh, you know that allows legislation to continue to grow um, as you know with the response, the national response. And so it's required to be reauthorized. And um, this year, the, the current version of the reauthorization expired September 30th, 2020. So we are uh, without, I'm sorry, 2021. So we are without um, any, any sort of coverage right now to move forward. Um, and in fact, uh, if you are a federal grantee, if you receive federal grant funding, you may notice like looking on websites like the Office for Victims of Crime, they haven't even posted their grant solicitations yet. Usually they're, they're posted by now, but there's no money. There's, there's no funding to continue to do this work. So it's, it's critical that we raise our voices, uh, that we let individuals know how important um, this is uh, to continuing the fight and supporting the NGOs that are working their butts off. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but you know, they're, they're working so incredibly hard in the field to provide this funding and, and, or I'm sorry, the programming, but they need the funding to be able to do it. Right. Um, so, uh, th this is, this is super critical. Uh, I have another question for you. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. What can uh, I mentioned be before at the very beginning of the conference, how fair trade certification is so important. I know that you address really what's going on in the United States. What suggestions do you have as an expert in this field about how we can kind of help? Because the problem, you, you and I agree totally, we're all touched by human trafficking. What is Bill Wolf and his family and his NGO? What do you suggest to people? Of course, I show bottles of iced tea that are fair trade. And guess what I get to eat after this is all over? My Alter Echo chocolate bar, no Hershey's. I have earrings that are fair trade. I wear uh, human trafficking. What can people do kind of support those people in the world that are trying to avoid their families get into human trafficking? Yeah, I, I think that's such a great question, right? And again, I think it's uh, to your point, Judy, it, it's, a, it, it's proof that um, or a reminder that human trafficking has the potential to touch each and every one of us, right? In ways that we don't even really consider, right? We're not we're not really thinking about. And so I think fair trade is is critically important. Educating yourself, uh, you know, there's lots of websites out there where you can go to reference wh what are fair trade products, uh, what are products that are known to be made with with slave labor. And so I think just from a personal accountability standpoint, uh, knowing what you're purchasing um, and taking the time to educate yourself. But I think there's a Another thing that we could be doing too, right? And that is again, from the perspective of NGOs and from the fact of individuals, and that is advocating for good corporate social responsibility policies. So one of the things that we've been working with Congressman Smith's office is how do we um, hold American businesses uh, accountable for their practices, in particular overseas, right? And and so there's a lot of room, again. What, what what's the old saying, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword, right? And so, you know, your words matter, your voice matters, your advocacy matters in this space. And I am happy to connect with anyone that wants to know, you know, how can they make their voice be heard? Um, but there are lots of NGOs that you can support that you can come alongside that are focusing on some of these very specific issues in particular labor trafficking, um, like fair trade. I'll also uh, shameless plug 
uh, for Anti-Trafficking International. Uh, so uh, ATI is having a webinar, I think it's next week, the 27th, um, on labor trafficking. Great. So uh, I would encourage you all to go uh, to the website. It's preventht.org, preventht.org. Uh, and um, uh, that, uh, and, and sign up for that webinar, uh, that's going to be hosted by um, um, a true professional, uh, Dr. Mary Graw Leary. Uh, she is a law professor um, at uh, Columbus Law School in Washington, D.C., uh, but she is a true expert on labor trafficking, has worked on these spaces as well. Um, and I also want to give a quick shout out. I, I saw a, a message pop up that uh, Dr. Stephanie Street is on this call or on this uh, web or this conference as well. Uh, she is a, a fantastic example of advocacy in your roles and coming alongside and supporting NGOs. Uh, Dr. Street is uh, an expert in her own right and works uh, in, in the school system in Virginia and has been advocating for prevention curriculum. And we have finally uh, gotten uh, that over the hurdle to where the school district is ready to implement. Dr. Street, I know I, I owe you a response on some dates uh, that we have a, a meeting coming up, so I'll get that to you. Um, but her, her work, her advocacy, her voice has been critical uh, in, in moving some of these efforts forward for NGOs. And then, um, as I typically like to do, we were able to recruit her as a volunteer for ATI. Uh, and so she is now on staff supporting some of our uh, professional development training, as well as our prevention curriculum. Um, uh, but again, advocacy work is, is so critically important in the fight to end human trafficking. And you can all do something right now, which is so easy. If you go to your um, Apple Store or your Google Play Store, download the sweat and toil app on your phone and when i go shopping and i want to buy a banana i find i find out where child slave labor is used to harvest bananas or cacao so it's real easy i don't know if you can see this but it's a sweat and toil app and it's in your google play store or your app or your apple store and just go shopping and it will tell you everything that involves any kind of slavery in terms of uh, labor trafficking and it says it distinguishes between child labor and it distinguishes between child labor and adult labor. But you will not buy a banana from a country if you look at that and you'll know, no, I can't buy it from this country because it uses children as slaves. So it's a great app. So I'm just waiting to see if Barbara's on. Um, James is, um, Bill, first of all, thank you very much for your fifth year here. You oh, my pleasure. Year. Every year you're going to come. Absolutely. <laughs> I would be upset if I didn't come. Uh, Marquita, um, uh, is, is Barbara Amaya on? Is anybody in Barbara? Can you hear me? She just needs to unmute her mic and then we'll bring her up. And Do you're going to have to share her slides from your side, if you will. I, I will try. Um, James, I, I sent you, I don't think I have them. Oh, she said she, she emailed them to you and from a Google link. If you want, send that to me and I'll try it as well. I did. I did. I okay. sent it to you. All right. Um, but I don't see her on here yet. So um, do you see her on here? Barbara, are you on here yes. yet? She's here. She's just having some audio issues. Can, uh, um, I'm going to try to unmute uh, her. I just have to find her. Barbara, I'll be right there. there. Goes. If anybody wants to take a bathroom break. She's here. just unmuted. Here. Yay, Barbara. And you're unmuted? I don't know. Am I? <laughs> yes, you are. And James is working on pulling your Google slides up. So let me introduce you, okay? Sure. What's up with the PowerPoint? Nothing. <laughs> James, that, that's why we have James and uh, Marquita and Durant here. They're the geniuses. I said okay. send that, please. I, I don't have it. Okay. I sent it to Judith. It's it, and she said she sent it to you. I don't know. Anywho, too bad. I got I got a really cool PowerPoint that I sent you guys. Wow. Barbara, I, I will look for that, but let me introduce you first, okay? Uh okay. So, and, and then I will pull it up as fast as I can, but I did send you what I had, James, um, where Barbara specifically yeah, says that was the Google slides. Ago, like 15 minutes yeah. to James. I don't know. Okay. So, I, I ask you to please, we've already talked about you a little bit, Barbara, but we just finished with Bill, who did a phenomenal job as always. Yep. But I ask you, all of you, to please listen closely to our next guest speaker. 
I'm so honored that Barbara could be with us today. And she knows more about this topic than all of us combined. Who is Barbara Amaya? Well, she's an author. Barbara, your resume is too long, but I'll go through it. She's an author, an award-winning author, an advocate, a survivor of domestic sex trafficking, works with Bill, which is two fabulous people working together, as a director of survivor leadership, survivor leadership at Anti-Trafficking International. She's a trainer, a motivational speaker, a TED talker, an author of an Amazon best selling memoir, Nobody's Girl. And if you can see, Nobody's Girl is on my Kindle. Got, got it. I can't wait to read it. Um, Nobody's Girl, a memoir of lost innocence, modern day slavery, and transformation. She has another book, a graphic novel called The Destiny of Zoe Carpenter, with its accompany curric accompanying curriculum which is aimed at educating the most vulnerable population in the United States for trafficking, middle and high school students about trafficking. And that's the one that traffickers target, the young, our young. She will share her expertise in these ways as she is leading the battle against domestic sex trafficking in our country, especially that which involves minors. She has lectured everywhere, George Washington University, University of Pennsylvania, Penn State, Virginia Commonwealth University, NYU, so all schools I couldn't get into, George Mason University, and she's given expert testimony when legislation has come up about human trafficking. She's a training consultant. She's a task force member. She trained for the Department of Justice, the Office for Victims of Crime Training and Technical Assistance Center. She was a member of the Department of Justice's Human Trafficking Task Force, the Virginia Human Trafficking Task Force, and NOVA. Um, NOVA which is a victim's organization. She received the highly coveted James B. Hunter Human Rights Award Advocacy for her work. By the way, Barbara, I Googled you. you Want to know how many hits you have? <laughs> Just shy of 6 million hits. I know. Okay. <laughs> that always tells me a lot. And Barbara will tell you her story um, about uh, being trafficked, overcoming heroin addiction, ter horrific trauma, sexual, everything horrible, and cancer that was directly related to what the, the crimes that she suffered. And now what does she do? She turns around and takes all of that evil and turns it into good. And she is a trainer in the, the, on the front line. She trains cops. She trains service providers. She trains law enforcement, healthcare professionals, teachers, People who don't even realize they're on the front line, counselors. And the distinction with someone like Barbara is she knows about trauma informed, how to deal with a victim who is trauma, it has a different form of trauma than we've ever dealt with before because she is the expert. She knows that a, a trafficking victim is unlike any other victim that those of us with 30, 40 years in criminal justice really were not used to dealing with. She has a background in education, credentials in early childhood, a PhD in psychology. She um, has been fighting human trafficking since 2012. She's worked with uh, helping us learn to identify and interview human trafficking victims, strategies for those who come out of leaving the life, as she puts on parentheses, how survivors of human trafficking can go from victim to vic victim to victor, the cult of human trafficking, which I'm really interested in. And she answers this question, why don't they just leave? She lectures also on the opioid connection to human trafficking. It is truly a great honor to introduce author, advocate, and survivorship leader, Barbara Amaya. Hello. Welcome, Barbara. How are you? Good. Uh, it's, uh, it's really great to be here today. I guess you can all see me here on the uh, meeting. Um, of course, we had some technical difficulties. And I have this fantastic PowerPoint that I'm staring at on my Chromebook that I could, anyway, that I couldn't share with you guys. Um, I'm, I'm going to probably at some point uh, here this morning read 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 some of these slides to you guys because, um, you know, the theme of this event was the 20th anniversary of the TVPA, and um, I have recently gathered a lot of information and interviewed multiple survivors of trafficking 
And um, I wanted to share with you all their thoughts about the TVPA. Um, so I don't have that much time here this morning. Um, thank you for that fantastic introduction and <laughs> talking about all those uh, all those Google hits. I don't know. I don't know about all that. But um, five point eight million to be exact. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, sometimes I do I do check that out though, and then I'm like, wait, who are these people that have me on their website? But anyway, um, it's 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 good. The PowerPoint is on its way to James. This topic is okay. I'm looking at it. It's right here on my Chromebook. Anyway, um, so I was going to share uh, a picture of myself at age 12 and Moses, the trafficker that uh, brutally exploited me for, you know, when I left New York City, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I didn't even know how old I was, but I believe I was 22 or 24. Anyway. Um, so I'm going to share with you all some parts of my story in the time that I have her this morning. I'm sitting in a house in Arlington, Virginia. I'm originally from Fairfax, Virginia, which is one of the highest cost of living areas in the United States. And I'm saying that because I want and, and, and I want everyone that knows that it doesn't know or does know or whatever, that this can happen. Human trafficking can happen to anyone. And like like Mr. Bill Wolf says, predators prey on the vulnerable. We're all vulnerable at some point in our lives, right? If it's that 12 year old Barbara or a 35 year old man that gets trafficked for labor purposing purposes uh, because his family is starving, you know? So it's it's about vulnerabilities being preyed upon and we, 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 sh we know that, we, we should know that, right? So I was in my Fairfax, Virginia home. I'm going to try to give you a brief synopsis of what I experienced. I can capsulize it into a few minutes here. So I was in my, my Fairfax, Virginia home, and I was being sexually abused there and um, other types of abuse, every kind of abuse. Um, from the outside, the house looked great, but it, it wasn't great. Um, I stopped going to school. I was obviously a very troubled child. Things were going on. And so I was taken out of that home and I was put into foster care systems, juvenile justice systems, all of those systems. And I was kind of shuffled around all over the place uh, in Virginia. And every single place that I was put into, every placement, every home, I would run away. And I didn't really, I didn't, I was, 11, 12, I didn't know what I was running away. I was just running, I was running, I was running. And I was running, now I know, I was running to find what I wasn't getting, what every child needs, right? A home, a roof, food, love, encouragement, you know, all of those things that I wasn't receiving, I was looking to find. And that's what traffickers have figured out, that they will act like they're providing this, right? Um, so at any rate, I, I had run away from um, a, an institution in Richmond, Virginia called Bonaire, which is basically kind of like a, a, a prison for children. I had been placed there. So I ran away from there. I ended up in Washington, D.C., and a young woman there approached me, and she portrayed herself as very kind and very sweet, took me back to her apartment where her boyfriend was waiting, but it wasn't her boyfriend. It was her trafficker. Um, she had been sent out to recruit uh, and find victims. Uh, and so she brought me back. They, 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 they groomed me for purposes of prostitution for several weeks in Washington, D.C. And then one day they took me to the corner of 14th and I streets, which was the track in those days. Uh, it's still parts of it still are is right now, actually. Um, everything doesn't happen online now. A lot of it does, obviously, but not everything. Right. Not everything. Um, so they 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 did that for several weeks, and um, you know, I I was so vulnerable, and I was so needy at that point in my life. I probably would have done whatever they wanted me to do, right? I bonded with these people. I didn't want to leave them. I wanted to stay there with them, right? As horrible as that sounds, one day. They took me to the corner of 14th and I streets and this person came walking down the sidewalk. And I really wish you could see my PowerPoint because I have a photo of the trafficker actually. Maybe I could show it to you on my phone, I don't know. 
anyway, he um, came walking. Barbara, can you share it? Can you go to the bottom and just hit the word share? I, I tried. I mean, I sent you guys the PowerPoint. I was thinking I could turn. Yeah, you know what? I need. I need your permission. It's denying me permission. I, I could show you the um, picture on my phone on the um, PowerPoint. Wait a minute. Let me see what's. If you give, if you give me permission, James will have permission. Yeah, I, I gave you permission to. I sent it to you, so I don't know. No, what. it 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 just keeps denying me. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. Google. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my phone and go. Look, can you see that photo? <laughs> no. Yep. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Well, there's the slide. So that's 12 year old Barbara. Oh, you can see it clearly. Okay. And that is Moses Ivory Leon Spears. And that's actually, I'm jumping ahead, but that's a prison photo because he actually jumping ahead in my story here, but he was, um, extradited from New York City on drugs and weapons charges, and he was imprisoned in um, Ohio. And I didn't find out until now, many, 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 many years later, when the Akron Police Department contacted me and told me that he had died in prison. I didn't know that. But at any rate, that day, many, many years ago, when I was 12 years old, that that was me. Um, the two people that had groomed me for purposes of prostitution handed me over to him. What I found out, you know, law enforcement asked me one time, was this organized crime? And I said, no, no. Well, it kind of was because he had people in major cities funneling him victims, right? I don't know how many um, victims he had over those years, but it was in the hundreds, hundreds of victims he, he brutally exploited. His street name was Moses, and I, I'm sorry for people of faith that I'm gonna tell you this, but his street name was Moses because he said he led all the hoes to the promised land. That was his street name. Um, I didn't put him in prison, but he did die in prison. So anyway, when they, when they handed me over to him, he drove me up to New York City and he began the process of the trauma bond formation. He made sure I saw he had a gun. He made sure that I knew he was the person in charge, but he also made sure that he positioned himself as my protector and he was gonna take care of me and he was gonna be kind. And there was no, I used to say sex, but it would have been rape because I was a child. There was no, none of that involved because that would have made a completely different dynamic that he was trying to form there. So he took me to New York city and he had another young woman take me out into the street in Manhattan and um, I had to bring him money every day for over 10 years in New York City. He told me one time, you know, you're probably gonna be arrested and you're probably gonna be treated like a criminal and I, you, just, you just need to run fast. And I was arrested many, many, many times. Um, I, uh, I was arrested so many times. I, I caught cases and I was I was you know in and out of just arrested multiple times. And I was in Rikers Island prison at one point as well. Um as the years went on, remember I was a child, I was growing up as I was being trafficked. So everything that was happening to me was you know, that, that's how my brain was forming. I was growing up while I was being trafficked. Um, when I was sick, I would go to the hospital emergency room. I remember one time I went to St. Vincent's Hospital, which is no longer there, I believe. And I was laying on a gurney in the hallway. I was very, very sick. And, and, and you know, it was the emergency room. It was very hectic and I didn't want to leave. I, I preferred staying in the hospital emergency room than leaving and going back out into the street. But I had to, I had to leave. So the question, question is, <clears throat> if I was arrested multiple times and I was in hospitals around medical professionals and um, obviously around adult men, what happened? Why didn't anyone say, wait a minute, how old are you? How old is that girl? Let's look at her again.
I don't care how much makeup I had on or what clothing I had on. How old was I? You know, when I when I was arrested, it was really fast. It was what's your name? How old are you? What's your address? And they would take a they would take a photo, a Polaroid photo. I have one photo from that time period at a police station. Um, at any rate, that went on for multiple years, many, 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 many years. And uh, about two thirds of the way through, another person out on the street introduced me to heroin. And I can still remember that day very clearly. She took me up town in, in New York to Harlem and she introduced me to heroin and heroin washed over my body and it numbed my mind to what I was surviving. And um, I didn't stop from that day forward. I just kept on doing drugs. And people, people used to ask me, well, wasn't it him, the trafficker that gave you these drugs? No, why would he do that? You know, he was already controlling me. He had no need to give me anything else to control me. Actually, it took away from the money that I was supposed to be bringing him. Um, if I didn't bring him a certain amount of money every day, he would beat me with coat hangers or whatever, you know, throw me out of a car, throw me down the stairs. Um, it was a very brutal existence. Um, at the end of my time in New York City, like I said, I think I was 22, 23, some, around there. Um, and I had this horrible addiction and I wanted to stop. I, I knew I was gonna die soon. I knew that, I knew it very, I knew it. So I went into a drug clinic and it was the, this is important, I think. It was the receptionist. It wasn't a counselor, it wasn't a doctor, it wasn't a therapist. It was it was the, the, the receptionist at the front desk that for some reason took an interest in me and gave me eye contact and made me feel like a human being. You know, she took time out of her day at the front desk at this clinic and she made me feel like a human being. She made me feel like I mattered and I hadn't felt like that. I don't remember feeling like that, you know, so she took time and she, she tried to um, send me on job interviews, which was pretty hilarious because I was like sending a feral cat on a job interview because I had no idea how to go on a job interview. Um, I, and by the way, one of the many rules from um, Moses was no reading, no writing, no, no tele. I mean, I was submerged into a criminal underworld completely. Um, when I finally managed to leave New York with the aid of this receptionist, Anita, it was like returning from another planet. I, I had missed major, major news about the world. Um, I didn't know how to uh, open a bank account. I certainly didn't know how to go on a job interview. I had a six, fifth, what, fifth grade formal education at that point. Um, but I knew how to hide everything very well. I knew how to act like everything was okay, which is what survivors are very good at. Um, they're very good at, 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 at acting and, and just acting like everything's great. Right. But it wasn't. So Anita, Anita found out that I had a sister living in, um, nearby Philadelphia. She managed to get me over there and I never went back to New York city. Um, but once again, you know, that was the family that I had been taken out of, right? So I didn't really stick around very long um, when I when I left New York and I was reunited with the family. Um, I, I I didn't know what to do with myself. You know, you know, victim survivors. What what are we what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to start leading a productive life. How could I do that with criminal records? You know, how, how am I going to do that? How am I going to get an apartment? How am I going to go back to school? What, what am I supposed to do with my life? You know, I had all these questions. And I think um, the TVPA addresses some of these issues. Um, but I don't know how much more time I have here, so I'm going to share this. I think in this PowerPoint, I included about 10 different survivors' thoughts about the TVPA. So I'm really sad that we couldn't share it. I'm sharing it in about one minute. Oh, I got it. okay. I'll keep talking then. <laughs> Please. 
Yeah, I mean, I just think what they had to say was kind of important because, uh, okay, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so, so, so yeah, so I left New York City, had no idea what I was supposed to do. I thought, you know, from watching television, oh, I'm what am I supposed to do? Uh, finish my education, get married, have a child. I don't know, what am I supposed to do? So some of those things work kind of good and some of them didn't work well at all because um, survivor, I didn't know how to set boundaries with other human beings, right? I, I didn't know how to do that. Um, I would always pick the wrong person to be my partner in life, you know, and I, and I did get married, but unfortunately that didn't work out. We tried to have a child, um, didn't know what was wrong. What's wrong? Why can't you have a child? What's going on? Why can't you get pregnant? What's happening? My doctor sent me to an infertility specialist because of all the trauma to my body as a child, I had to have surgery in order to have my daughter. And I do have a daughter, one daughter, who is an emergency room nurse. So that's great. <laughs> I don't know about, you know, uh, I mean, we, we get along, we get along okay. <laughs> I'm sure Bill is laughing if he's listening to this. But anyway, um, so I, you know, I didn't come into this journey of advocacy until 2012, 2013. I was laying in this living room on that couch. The news was on and it was one of, uh, it was a case with Mr. Bill Wolf. And I heard them talking about uh, human trafficking and I didn't even know what the term meant. Me, never heard it before. I knew what drug trafficking was very well, but I didn't know what human trafficking, what's that? I don't know what that means, you know? I wasn't really paying attention and I was in a very, very dark place. Dark depression, dark place, you know, PTSD, dark place. Uh, so then they started talking about the recruitment techniques that these gang members were using about a mile from here. And I went, what? Wait, 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 what? And I stood up and I turned up the volume and I had that aha moment that everybody wants. I had that epiphany. I had a true epiphany. I stood up, I have goosebumps because I stood up and I went, what? That's what happened to me. Was I a victim? I was a victim? Really? Wait, wait, it's still happening now? And I got very, 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 very angry that it was still happening. Because when we experience trauma as human beings, we often think we're the only ones that's, that have experienced this. It's very interesting to me. Um, so that was my aha epiphany moment. I stood up and I realized that I was a victim. And not only was I a victim, there were many, many victims and I had to do something. I had to do something. I wasn't sure what at that point in 2012, but I had to do something. Um, I just got very angry. And within a, about a week, I was on that same news channel. Ah, here we go. Now the PowerPoint. How do we do the slides though? How do we move them along? Yes, James. James, can you do the slides for us, please? Or Marquita or Durant? Yeah, let's just- Do not have access to any of that to do them. We're getting into the TVPA part now, so. Um, let's see where we are. There's the Moses picture. There's the talking about there the TVPA. How about the slide that says what human trafficking survivors understand about the TVPA? That's slide number five. Um, you know, so that that's kind of my story um, in a nutshell there. Um, I came to this journey of advocacy and I have a hashtag, nothing about us without us. And by that, I mean the survivor voice. And I'd also like to say, um, I, ha I have another, another hashtag, awareness, education, legislation. And I, and I really believe in, in that, that one as well. So as I mentioned earlier, I was speaking with, you know, over the years and then, and then coming to this event this morning, I was like, wait a minute, the TVPA, you know, Trafficking Victims Protection Act, 20th year anniversary. And so I started revisiting some of the survivor leaders and survivors that I know. And I, and I talked to them about this and many of them said things like, um, here, let me read this. Uh, this is, it remains disappointing that law enforcement, and, and, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're basically saying we need more awareness. We need more, we need more awareness campaigns. Um, one survivor said, I am unclear as to how the TVPA, uh, assist survivors um let's go on to number the number six. Oh, this is connie rose she says 
survivors that we save impact primarily being she does a lot of expungement work by the way i i was able to return to um expunge all of my arrest records uh from new york city i went back to the same courtroom sat in the same courtrooms where i had been sitting when i was arrested and um I was able to clear all those records from my name. So that was, that was good. That was in 2013, I believe. Um, she says, Connie Rose says, every survivor I've worked with since 2010, none of them knew that the TVPA even existed. So this, this is a theme that um, if we, if we go on to uh, slide numbers, wait, that's another, that's Connie Rose again. Let's go to slide. Oh, okay. This is Gina Cavallo. She had quite a bit to say about the TVP. I guess you guys can see the slides anyway. Um, I mean, basically the theme that I'm getting from survivors is we, many survivor leaders, I'm not saying, you know, they're, they're uneducated or they're completely unaware of the TVPA. Uh, however, a, a few of them, a few of them were, you know, and I've had survivor leaders that have nonprofits say, I've worked with survivors and, and victims and survivors that don't even know it exists. So whose job is it to, to bring this to survivors, right? Who's, you know, they need to do campaigns. They need to bring awareness. They need to make sure who's they. I mean, I think we are all there, aren't we? Hmm. I don't know how much more time I have here. That's another, let's see. I have two Gina slides. I'm trying to go down to slide number nine somehow. I, I, I'll just keep forwarding. Just tell me the number. Um, nine. I'm on nine. Um, okay, a survivor said, I've read the, I've read about the TVPA, but I don't really fully understand it because I don't use it on a daily basis. So that, that statement, I've heard of the TVPA for the first time in November. I'm learning more about it. I know the TVPA exists. I've read some parts of it, but I don't specifically work with it on a daily. I mean, what does that mean? I mean, you know, you know, when you look at, at all the reiterations of the, when you look at the you know, the, the TVPA, it is, it is very confusing if you're not an attorney. I mean, you know, if you're not a lawmaker, it, 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 there's a lot in there, right? So how do we bring this to survivors? You know, how do we make sure that they know that it's even in existence, right? Um, oh, this slide number, this slide number 10 is very important to me. This slide number 10 is from Faith and Faith was uh, trafficked by a Mexican cartel into New York City. Now, Faith, um actually recently testified and against her uh traffickers she was brave enough to testify against these cartel traffickers in Man in, in manhattan she testified and they got uh 40 years each excellent yeah so she says she walked into the new york city police station after escaping from the trafficker no one there in the police station spoke about the tvpa or any services offered I was a minor, and by the way, she was a minor at that time. Uh, I was a minor and immigrant from Mexico. You know, part of the TVPA is the T visa. So that would have been really great. Um, of course, now she has obviously um, been able to find uh, a lot of relief through the TVPA and, and what it offers. But at that time, you know, as a minor, as a young girl escaping, being brave to get away from these horrible people, you want to call them that, you know, she, 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 she needed assistance. Um, so let's go on. Uh, number, what are we on? 11. Yeah. I mean, I think what can we do, right? I mean, what can we do? I think It's just all about what, what it, it's just all about, you know, awareness and education. My hashtag, right? Awareness, education, legislation. How do we do that? We need funding to do that. There are some great nonprofits out there that are working tirelessly to try to get funding to make sure that they can bring more awareness and education to the, to the world, right? So I think that's a whole nother on a whole other topic <laughs> about funding. How do they get funding? Um, I think my time might be about up, but if anybody has any questions, we can just go on the last slide. It just says, thank you. Um, if anybody wants to ask me anything, I'm here. 
um, and I am open to answering any question, pretty much. Barbara, what is it about a human trafficking victim that is different from the typical victim we dealt with in the criminal justice system? Like, do they, do they self-identify as victims? Are, is their trauma different? And then that will be, we'll move on to the next speaker after that. Thank you. Sorry about the ambulance outside. Yeah, I mean, that that's, 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 that's exactly one of the main problems that I hit on earlier, you know, victims don't self-identify as victims. They don't, you know, um, I didn't for how many years, decades, I did not self-identify. I never thought I was a victim and victims do not self-identify. How are you going to provide services for someone that doesn't even think they need services? They don't even believe they need services. Um, and, and forget about all the PTSD and all of the uh, issues that they probably have, right? So how do you provide services for someone that doesn't think they need service? How do you bring them to the point where they self-identify as a victim? I mean, my own experience was just call it what you will, you know, I mean, I just, everything aligned at that moment and I had that epiphany. That doesn't happen to everyone. Um, Trauma-informed therapy, counseling. Um, I also mentioned yeah. victims are very, very good. Survivors are very good at hiding everything because we had to learn to do that, right? So, Breaking through those barriers, breaking through those walls, you know, it just takes some really deep counseling and therapy, right? You can't just say, oh, you're done. You're out of New York now, or you're out of wherever you were, and now you're, you're all great. You're just gonna move forward with your life and go back to school and get a job and get married or whatever you're gonna do, and good luck with it. Oh, and by the way, those criminal records you probably have, uh, I don't know what to tell you about that. I remember when I started this journey of advocacy, there were seven, only seven states that allowed uh, victims to clear their, their, by the way, clear their records they never should have gotten in the first place. I'm not saying every criminal in the world needs to have their records clear, but what was I? Was I a victim or a criminal? What are, you know, were laws being broken? Yes. That's law enforcement's job to uphold the law. So laws were being broken, but what was I? So it gets it gets very convoluted. Anyway, well, people are asking to more for you share your story. So let's I'll, I will put in the chat. Give us your website. Oh, my my website. It's it, barbaramaya.com. Two A's and so the there's a lot Barbara B A R B A R A A M A Y A. There's a whole bunch of A's. <laughs> dot com. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's available too. And, and Barbara, I thank you so much. I'm sorry for the technical difficulty. I figured out what the problem was. It was uh, just a weird Google slides. I'm not used to dealing with it. I know. So happy to have you. And would you come back and speak to my students? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Okay. Thank we'll you. Come back and speak. Thank you. Well, um, it's my, my absolutely my privilege. You're so doing now Barbara, Barbara has done the survivor and the NGO with Bill. We're going to switch now to the law enforcement response. Barbara, would you like to say hello to Chief Deputy Ken Sarvis and Detective uh, Will Campbell? Barbara Amaya, a survivor, uh, an incredible uh, asset to the human trafficking, anti-human trafficking movement. Hi, guys. Thank you, Barbara. God bless. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to introduce now Chief Deputy Ken Sarvis and Detective Will Campbell from the New Hanover County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Deputy, uh, Chief Deputy Ken Sarvis has been there for 30 years. He's done so much. Your resume is long like Barbara's. Detective Division Commander, of course, he's now the Chief Deputy. A Support Services Division Commander, Assistant Division Commander, Watch Commander in the Detention Division. He was a Patrol Sergeant, a deten Detention Sergeant, a Detective, a School Resource Officer. I love those. I loved it when the kids, my kids went to high school with the SROs. Canine Officer, which I love dogs an ERT team for 14 years. He's a law enforcement instructor. He does the BLED and service training, et cetera. Um, of course, subject control and arrest technique instructor. And he's gone to NC State's administrative office uh, for his education, as well as the FBI National Academy, Department of Homeland Security. But he is going to be the proud graduate of a UNC Pembroke degree. 
in March of 2022. He's taking a graduate course as well right now. A phenomenal student. He loves to fish and hunt. He's married to his wife, Jan, with two daughters and a son and five grandchildren. And we thank Chief Deputy Service for his service to the military. He was in the U.S. Air Force. With him is the boots on the ground here in Wilmington, New Hanover Sheriff's Officer Will Campbell, who's now assigned to the Federal Task Force as an officer with the FBI and is working the Wilmington Human Trafficking Task Force, as well as the Cape Fear Human, Task, Human Trafficking Rapid Response Team. And it's his job to really do everything that goes into interdicting human trafficking, investigation, both at the state and federal level, because the task force has him dealing with both New Hanover, of course, as well as um, the FBI. So that ski does both the state and the federal in eight different counties here in southeastern North Carolina. So he has to get search warrants, court orders. He do does arrest. He conducts victim, witness, and suspect interviews. And he testifies in both federal and state court. Not an easy thing to do. He provides investigative assistance to local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies on human trafficking. And he also now is looking, uh, I, I'm sure it's been for a while, but looking at not only commercial sex trafficking, but labor trafficking that we've talked about several times. And interestingly enough, on his resume, he it has a FBI top secret clearance, which I've never even known anybody who had that. And I was, I was in corrections a long time. And he has a lot of experience in narcotics, gangs, armed drug dealers, informants, cyber stalking, and of course, testifying. He won seven major awards, but I'm, I'm so honored that to know that he won Wilmington Officer of the Year from our best asset here for human trafficking other than Will Campbell, a safe place, a great NGO worthy of your support. There's some a safe place people here. They've spoken at my conference and I'm in awe of the work that they do. And I've heard that from many police officers too. They need a safe place here in Wilmington. It's so critical. And of course, Will does training. So uh, welcome Chief Deputy Sarvis and Detective Campbell who will give the law enforcement response to human trafficking. Welcome to UNC Pembroke. Thank you. And we are both glad to be here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, and you look great, guys. Thank you so much. And please thank the sheriff for us too. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, our response, uh, as, I, as I look at it as an administrator now in our agency, run the day-to-day -day operations for the sheriff's office, um, you know, I kind of want to speak to the perspective of what our response as, as a agency head should be. First of all, we got to realize it is a problem. Human trafficking is a problem. And the number one thing that we can do as an agency head is educate our officers on the uh, what it looks like, uh, what human trafficking looks like. And I'm proud to say in uh, 2014, before it was actually mandated to all North Carolina law enforcement officers, our sheriff's office actually provided that training and in service to every single officer. And we continue to provide human trafficking training for our officers today. And I think it's more important now than it has ever been. Um, and I just want to say this, uh, ironically, yesterday afternoon, Will was called to uh, about an hour away. We had a missing juvenile that was 16 years old uh, from our jurisdiction uh, last week. And uh, we found out that she was about an hour away. Uh, it only took two days. She was being human trafficked. And it was only took two days for her to be on a website. So we were able to go up there and, and successfully Gosh. retrieve her. And that just happened yesterday. And we've highlighted our, or identified two individuals, a, a male and a female, who were trafficking her, or trying to potentially traffic her. Congratulations, Jeff. It's going on. I, I, I bring that to light. Just it's going on. But one of, as I said, one of the main objectives for me is to educate all of our officers. Our officers uh, at every level are coming in contact with people often that if they are not aware of what human trafficking truly looks like, they may miss something. And I think several, uh, Barbara even said, you know, uh, how she was, you know, come in contact with law enforcement officers many times and, and, and was never questioned about, A, how old she is or, or anything else other than was just looking at her as a, a you know, as a suspect, as a, as a criminal. And, and these are, as many people have already said, these are victims and uh, we need to treat them as such. Um, but, you know, prior to 2013, the Sheriff's Office, as I said, 
we really didn't investigate trafficking. Uh, we investigated prosecution and we actually uh, targeted the prostitutes because that was the norm. Um, back when I came in law enforcement 30 years ago and, and really didn't know what human trafficking was and neither did many of my officers that I worked with. But now today, I'm glad to say we have been better educated, if you will. And, uh, and we talk about what trafficking looks like. And, um, and when the safe harbor, North Carolina safe harbor laws were signed by, by the governor in July, 2013, it actually took the old and outdated prosecution or prostitution laws and focused on combating the demand for and promotion of prostitution in layman's terms. It targeted the pimps and the johns. Uh, it provided, as it's been said, immunity and protection for the victims. And, uh, and I'm very thankful that we do have an organization like the North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission uh, that we can uh, use as a resource. And I would uh, encourage my law enforcement leaders around nation, but also in, in North Carolina to use your organizations as a resource to ga gain information and find out, as uh, Christine said earlier, they looked at where are the gaps. And I think as an organizational leader, we need to figure out where the gaps are. What are we missing as a law enforcement agency? And how can we better educate our personnel, number one, and also find out who these individuals are, who these victims are, and then who these perpetrators are and arrest them and get them, whether it's taking them federal or taking them state. Now, North Carolina, as it's already been said, has got some really good aggressive human trafficking laws. And a lot of times it's better to take them state than it is federal, depending on the circumstance. So there again, that's about being educated and uh, working with your DA's office, working with the local, uh, you know, your partners here, your federal partners and find out where you can get your best bang for your buck uh, is getting these people put away. Um, as I said, in 2014, the sheriff's office developed and implemented mandatory in, in service training for all sworn law enforcement uh, officers within our agency, and I can't, there again, cannot uh, expound enough on that, how important that is. Uh, something we also did, we didn't really know how bad the problem was here in North Carolina or in Wilmington, our, our jurisdiction. We knew we had a problem, we just didn't know how bad it was. So we made a collateral position detective. So in other words, he was doing this on the side. We realized real quickly that we needed to make this a full-time position. And we also partnered with uh, our Safe Streets uh, FBI task force and, uh, and attached that detective to that, and uh, which opened up a lot more resources for us uh, because they're not just staying, uh, criminals don't know jurisdictional lines. They don't just stay in one jurisdiction, they travel. And if it gets too hot one place, they'll go to another place. So we need to be able to have the opportunity to partner with our federal partners and our state uh, SBI. Um, another important aspect as a law enforcement agency is to partner, and it's already been said, with your local NGOs. Uh, we have here a phenomenal organization in the safe place. Matter of fact, the director just came out and met with our sheriff last week, and uh, we have a a mutual aid agreement with them. And uh, we make our officers aware of safe place and, and what they offer. And um, so it's important for that. And there again, I said, we have to stay in constant communication with our DA's office. So important to do that uh, on the prosecution side. Um, and uh, I'm going to kind of turn it over to uh, Will here, cause he's gonna talk to you about what happens with the boots on the ground and uh, and it's been said also by some other people, but it's real important for we've got over 50 SROs, school resource officers, and that's not counting the college. We also are responsible. We've got nine college resource officers at a local Cape Fear Community College. Anytime you have a beach, colleges <laughs> and, and over 200 and some thousand people, you're going to have. Uh, major issues with some type of trafficking uh, and, uh, you know, don't kid yourself. You know, we always like to think about it's not going on in our backyard, but I think uh, if you're going to be real uh, and you're going to be uh, able to combat this human trafficking, you got to realize it's going on right here. And the potential for victims is extremely high when you have college campuses, when you have uh, the amount we have here, we've got one of the biggest uh, universities here in UNCW 
And then we also have a huge uh, Cape Fear Community College, which is a huge community college. So we've got a lot of things, moving parts here that makes us uh, vulnerable, if you will. Um, but nonetheless, I'm going to turn it over to Will and let him talk a little bit about uh, what he does day in and day out. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Chief Debbie. Thank you, Judy. Um, I'm, I'm just honored to be kind of uh, on the same sheet of paper with people like Bill Wolf and, and Christine and now Barbara. I stole a lot of pages out of Bill's playbook back in, in 2012 when that was kind of my start to uh, human trafficking. I, I started with the sheriff's office in 2010 uh, where I worked in the jail. I worked uh, on the street as a patrol officer and then uh, was promoted to detective in uh, 2012. And uh, when I was promoted, I, I came into a spot that's called the juvenile detective. And that wasn't because of my age then, but uh, it was it was kind of the low man on the totem pole for the de detective division. And uh, we we investigated crimes that were committed by uh, juvenile def juvenile offenders. Um, so at that time, that's 2012. Uh, I got a call from my, my then supervisor and captain and said, um, Wilmington Police Department has, has got a case where uh, their offender is using the jail phone and, and trying to talk his witness and, and victim into not pressing charges. And what he was doing was, was using a different PIN number to uh, contact this girl and basically begging her to not show up. And WPD needed help with the jurisdictional issues because they don't have jurisdiction out here at the jail. And... Um, they asked me to look into it mainly because it was a minor crime and I was a brand new detective. Uh, so they needed help charging basically a, a really almost a misdemeanor out here. So that case, um, when it got started, it was, like I said, with the, the Wilmington Police Department, a domestic violence detective. And as he dug into these jail calls and looking into it, he, him and uh, a WPD analyst, which I think she was an intern at the time, I saw her name pop up earlier, um, Rebecca Sixto literally uncovered a human trafficking ring that was operating from Wilmington to New York to California to Las Vegas. And that started with a, a jail phone call, literally somebody using the wrong pin number on jail phone calls. And it, that I'll kind of segue into, you know, the, the training and things like that. But in 2012, when this happened, if you asked me what human trafficking looked like, I probably would have painted you a picture of Liam Neeson in the movie Taken and some girl in a corner chained to a radiator. And here we are living in the port city. And I'm thinking about, you know, individuals being stuffed in container ships and stuff like that. None of which of that has really happened in my, my, you know, time investigating this over the past 10 years. Um, and that what's, what's, you know, not ironic. It's just the, the facts. In the time when I got this start was the same time that, you know, Safe Harbor was being enacted, you know, 2013, uh, around that time. So I'm now going to trainings through the SBI and learning what, you know, human trafficking actually looks like. Um, and that's what kind of changed, you know, all, all that for me, the, the, um, the, the Safe Harbor laws. Um, Oh, and not to not to detail that case that, that much, because that, that could be a, a two hour presentation anyway, but I just want to talk very briefly about that ring and that case. Um, that guy there, it, it's funny, not funny, but, um, you know, Bill was working in Virginia at the time, I think around Fairfax, and then Barbara mentioned Fairfax as well. This guy was recruiting people here in Wilmington and often taking them right up the right up the road to Virginia Beach and around Fairfax and things like that. Um, uh, it, it's just crazy that that they that they mentioned those those uh, cities. So in 2013, things were starting to look differently for cops as far as human trafficking goes, but it also looked differently, you know, kind of for Johns, it was starting to change uh, for them as well. Back in the day, this chief kind of mentioned cops were, were targeting prostitutes, not um, the John, not the Johns, not the pimps, anything like that. And basically what that looked like for a cop or a John, the John wanted to, you know, a, a consumer for, for paid sex, wanted to find somebody to fill that role. He'd drive down the track, 
he'd pick out what he was looking for walking up and down and then he'd pull up to her and, and try to get her in the car and they'd strike a deal and, you know, be on their way. And it was the same, same thing for cops to try to target the prostitutes. You know, they, they do the same thing, pick them up, solicit them. And, uh, or there'd be some sort of solicitation and there'd be an arrest and they'd be on the way. Back then the cops weren't watching the guy across the street that was watching that girl, making sure she was working, making sure she was making money. They arrested her. And then a lot of the times he bonded her back out and she was right back to it again. And it was just a, a horrible revolving door. And it was the same thing for the Johns. Nothing was being done to, to target this demand. And, and as we progressed into this digital age, um, it, it got even easier for the Johns. Now, I, I oftentimes use this analogy where if you've used the, the Domino's app to order a pizza, you get on the app, you pick out what toppings you like, you pick out when you want it ready, and it's delivered right to you. Finding a girl now or, or a guy or you know, a, a victim, finding somebody for commercial sex is literally just as easy. You get on your phone, you pick out what you like, it's terribly explicit what they'll do and what they're into, and they deliver the girl or the guy right to you. Um, and with this ease of uh, this digital age and the ease into it, it's created this unbelievable demand for for sex. Um, and you can parallel, I, I hate to, to compare it like this, but look at how Amazon's grown over the years with the ease of the app and things being ordered or delivered to your house. It's, it's growing with it kind of in the, in the, in the same kind of way. So with that, you know, extensive demand, there's an extensive supply. And that kind of correlates to what I've heard of, I think Barbara said, uh, and Bill, um, traffickers are using the internet to recruit their new victims. Uh, basically every case I've worked since 2012, um, you can see these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages literally that are being sent every single day from traffickers to potential victims. And they're just sending, we used to call them, uh, I, basically it's a boilerplate message that gets sent out through various social media, uh, platforms where it's, you know, Hey, how are you? Uh, what's going on with you? Are you in school? Do you like school? Do you like your family? Is your family around? And they're going, they're hitting all these topics and they're looking for that one that hates school, is dropping out of school, parents aren't home, nobody's paying them the attention that they need. And it's this vulnerable um, uh, bracket that, that starts to talk back to them. And they know, you know, once that girl starts talking back to them, that they've got one. A lot of times in, uh, you know, this instance, you know, the, I've made this reference a hundred times that they're not generally not going to find a road scholar from Chapel Hill. That's going to take the time to respond to that. Um, they're getting somebody that needs that attention and, and point blank, the one that responds and, and starts talking to him is going to be one that eventually nobody's really going to be looking for in the end. Um, and they know that and they target that girl. And like the guy I talked about earlier that, that took, you know, one of his victims, the first one that I met, Rebecca took her to uh, Virginia and the way he approached it on social media was, well, let's go on vacation. I'm going to take you to vacation. I'm going to take you on a vacation. Let's go to the beach. So he drives from Wilmington. They stop in Walmart. She details that they stop in Walmart and Leland. He buys a couple cell phones, which he thought was weird. A couple burner phones, drives her to Virginia beach. They get there, they check in and not more than five minutes from being in the, in the hotel room. He explains to her now that you work for me and this is what you're going to do. And I won't go into the, the details of how heinous this guy is, but still, you know, one of the worst I've ever, ever investigated. Um, and what did he do? He, he took this girl from Wilmington that was vulnerable, that nobody was really looking for because she came from a, a rough home life, isolated her, takes her to Virginia Beach. And that's how he can basically convinced her that this is what she was going to do for him. Um, you know, and, and Bill and Barbara talked about that. They, they provide this, um, security blanket or this need for, you know, providing these, these basic needs. Um, and that's how they, they get them to do what they want and, and keep them from leaving. Um, 
and the, the the internet's helped with that too. The internet and and these the the websites that are used to promote these girls um, has has created this market where you can take a girl from Wilmington that, like I said, not too many people are going to be looking for, and you can drive her to Virginia Beach, or you can take her to Myrtle Beach, or you can take her to, you know, all around and advertise her there and sell her over and over and over and over again. Um, and you know, Judy, you talked about. Uh, a lot of a lot of these guys, you know, have drug and weapon backgrounds. They do. They they're I hate to say they're smart, but they've been in the drug world and they know the the the, the consequences that come with selling drugs and weapons. And uh, they've seen where where prior to all the the training and information that's, that's put out for human trafficking now, um, the the risk of getting caught was very low. Um, so that's kind of what it looked like on the the John side of it, and I, I detailed how it looked like for the cops. You know, walking, they're driving the driving the track and picking up girls and stuff like that. These guys had to be trained, like the chief said in 2014. They had to be trained differently to start seeing things different. You know, if a cop would have pulled over that pimp and Rebecca and the other two girls that were in the car driving to Virginia Beach, what does that look like? It, it just looks like a regular trip to the beach. It's a guy and two girls spring break but you, you you let them go and it's that's it they go on and they do their thing you pull over a guy a drug trafficker with a kilo of heroin in the car or a kilo of whatever a kilo of dope in the car what happens to that guy then that's it it's over that's all you got to do is find that when what was really in the car could have held you know higher higher uh sentences and, and ramifications than that kilo of dope so we had to train the officers to to look at things differently and to be able to separate them and talk to them and, and try to figure out what's actually going on. And, and just like Christine and Bill said, at that point, once you start talking to these girls, you absolutely cannot go at it alone. Um, we had to pair, uh, with our, with a safe place, basically on every single investigation. It's once we start working one, our first call is, uh, you know, assembling the troops to figure out how we're going to, you know, try to pick up this girl. And the second call is to a safe place because we can't, the best way to put it is we can't wrangle these girls. They they have to be there to help, you know, put them in a, in a better situation and to provide them. You're taking them, you're taking these girls from a situation where this pimp has provided everything they have to have to survive. You're pulling them away from that. A safe place has got to be there to be able to provide those, those basic life essentials to, to give them a reason to want to leave really. Um, so that's it. In, in order to have a successful, you know, investigation, you've got to, it's got to be a, a team approach uh, through your DA's office, buy in from your administration, sheriff's office, and the district attorney's office. You've got to have DAs that are willing to prosecute this stuff. And, you know, just like until 2013, it was, it was very easy to have one of these cases presented. And to look at it and say, ah, it's just the domestic violence or it's just, you know, something like that. It's a lot harder to make a human trafficking case as it is a, you know, assault case or something like that. So that's about all I've got. Um, if you guys have any questions or anything like that, again, Judy, thanks for, thanks for having us. Thank you, Will, and thank you, Chief Deputy. Um, I, I don't, we don't have time for questions because we're a little behind the time, but Thank you so much for, Will, I feel so safe with the sheriff and the Wilmington PD, but uh, especially with your work here in Wilmington. I, I think you, uh, an unbelievable job that you've done here on the task force and keeping us informed. And to those from you from a safe place, I just put up your site. If one of you could type in the website for a safe place and please support this wonderful NGO we have in Wilmington. Uh, Chief, I think you said it best. We're so blessed to have a safe place here. Um, and of course the reaction of our sheriff and our Wilmington PD. You guys took it seriously. And you made some great point about tourism, about college towns, also military installations get targeted by traffickers. And I really felt very confident with both the, both agencies, the sheriff and the Wilmington PD, and with Will Campbell right at the heart of it, that we're doing really well here in Wilmington uh, after 20 years of dealing with this crime. So thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Now we're going to move to the academic response and Dr. Veronica Hardy 
who is a UNC Pembroke professor of social work and a professional consultant to NGOs. So Dr. Hardy's coming up. She is in the Department of Social Work, a licensed social worker. She's an author. She's a professional consultant. Her PhD is in counselor education and supervision, and she also has an MSW degree. She's an author of mo uh, multiple book publications, including Becoming Untangled, Eight Simple Strategies for Cleaning Up Your Life, Mind, and Habits from the Process of Grief, the Underrated Form of Self-Care. She has co-authored academic journal articles focusing on child sex trafficking, including commercial sexual exploitation of adolescents, gender-specific and trauma-informed, very important trauma-informed care implications, as well as domestic minor sex trafficking, practice implications for clinical professionals, which is so important because the, the therapeutic community is yet to catch up with this new type of victim that we're dealing with. She's given many, 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 many presentations on human trafficking, <clears throat> both in local communities, to professional organizations, and at national and international conferences. And she also has developed an online elective course for social workers entitled Human Trafficking in the United States. And she served as a professional consultant, like I said, for non-governmental organizations, as well as various task forces and social service organizations. She also, as I mentioned, focuses on trauma-informed practice, which is so important for survivors of human trafficking because they deal with a trauma that most, most Americans have never dealt with. And it's so good that she does that. And of course, she works in the area of promoting racial equity because communities of color are more likely to be targeted um, than, than the general population. As a university professor, she has facilitated diversity-related courses with a teaching style focusing on effective process of multicultural competency development among mental health professionals. And I'm so privileged to welcome Dr. Veronica Hardy. Great, thank you so much, Judy, and thank you for that beautiful introduction. And like you said, that trauma-informed practice, trauma-informed care. So with that, I just wanna take a moment to pause. This has been an incredible conference. Thank you, Judy, for coordinating this, coordinating amazing presenters and speakers. And thank you, Barbara, for also sharing about your experience with us and helping to train us up too to be stronger out there in providing services, prevention, and awareness. I know that many of the topics that we have discussed and covered today have also been sensitive topics. You've heard that word trauma repeatedly, as well as the need for collaboration. So I just wanted to take a moment to check in. And I invite you, certainly if you feel safe and comfortable, to maybe just post in the chat how you are feeling right now, how you may be feeling emotionally. And for everyone else on the line to be able to check in, just checking in with each other. Throughout this conference, you have noticed Judy has been posting links to different organizations that provide services. So I continue to invite everyone who is a part of an NGO, nonprofit organization, service providers, to be able to post um, the services that your organization provides. And hopefully you're also able to see here on my title slide. Again, Judy posted this earlier in the chat, but the National Human Trafficking Hotline number is on this slide as well as their text number as well. Sometimes in situations people are not able to make that phone call, but may be able to make send a text message. Okay. So thank you everyone. Again, thank you Judy for the opportunity to present today. Um, Judy has already introduced me again. Thank you for that introduction. As you see at the bottom of this slide, I'm also an organizational consultant. So I did want to acknowledge the current organization that I am providing consultation to is called Doing It for the Kingdom, a nonprofit actually started by a UNCP alumni from our wow. Masters of Social Work program. And again, it is called Doing It for the Kingdom. It's a newer nonprofit within the Cumberland County area. Now, as many of you know, social work is what I refer to as an international profession, okay, with an emphasis on social justice, advocacy, and promoting healthy human relationships. 
Another major area that we tend to focus on is targeting those systems that develop and promote and sustain oppressive acts within society and that help to sustain poverty as well. As you may have heard previously through several of our speakers, susceptibility is an issue, susceptibility, vulnerability, and poverty creates vulnerability. Disparities in our communities, our geographic locations, our access to health care, all of those factors promote vulnerability. You heard Judy mention earlier today about homelessness, vulnerability. So again, those are areas that social work tends to target. So that's just the focus of my presentation today is about the social work response to these vulnerabilities and what we have done in regards to human trafficking. At the same time, I just wanted to acknowledge certain social workers who have been on the line throughout the day. Um, again, earlier you were introduced to Christine Long, who is the executive director of the North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission, a fellow social worker. Also on the line today, you may see Dr. Alice K. Locklear. She is currently serving on the board of directors for our National Association of Social Workers and representing our region. And she has a focus on oppression as well as indigenous populations. She's also a fellow colleague of Judy and Mines here at uh, University of North Carolina at Pembroke. You also see Virginia Locklear on the line too, who is the executive director of the Rape uh, Crisis Center here in Robinson County, who is very aware of the intersections between human trafficking and sexual assault. And that just gives you a small glimpse into that social work response to human trafficking that is happening right here in our state and within our counties. So I wanted to share just a brief story about when I was first introduced to human trafficking. And like Barbara mentioned, as she was speaking, what was human trafficking? What did that mean? So same with me, I generally did not hear that term until I became a professor at UNCP. But several years prior, probably exactly 20 years ago was when I was truly introduced to my first person that I was providing services to. Of course, certain information has changed for confidentiality purposes. Um, so I call this Eric's story. So I just say at the time, Eric was at the age of 10 and I was a social work therapist at a time at a certain uh, treatment facility. Um, Eric came from what we refer to as a, a urban environment, a major metropolitan area. In that facility, Eric was on a particular unit and whenever his stress level increased, he would close his eyes, he would scream, he would swing as if someone was coming at him, but no one was necessarily standing there. And people would question what was triggering these types of responses, trauma-related responses. Um, eventually, we learned that part of Eric's history was he was being sex trafficked by his caregiver. His caregiver was experiencing an addiction. And in order to support that addiction, Eric was being trafficked out to adult males. Okay, so just like you heard in our previous presentation that there is no particular face to human trafficking. Uh, the movie Taken does, doesn't capture what human trafficking looks like. This is what the human trafficking experience looked like to me. It can be someone in that person's family. It's, it's a very undercover crime that often goes unaddressed and unrecognized. So that awareness is key. Again, this is just the definition of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, a very truncated definition. But as we know, trafficking can take place in many forms, whether it's servitude or whether it's sex-related, commercial sexual exploitation, et cetera. Again, it can come in many forms. So please be sure to visit the various links, the website, such as Polaris Project's website, to see the various ways that we have found so far that human trafficking tends to occur in our country and internationally. 
um, to get more into the social work response to human trafficking. As I said earlier, we are an international profession. So what I wanted to do was to highlight some of the organizations across the waters that have been creating a response to human trafficking and other oppressive acts that are taking place across countries. We have first what is referred to as the International Association of Schools of Social Work, which focuses on uh, social work programs and education. We have the International Council on Social Welfare, which is an NGO that represents thousands of organizations that focuses on creating social welfare responses. Then we have the International Federation of Social Work Workers, which is a global federation of national social work organizations representing over 90 countries and over 750,000 social workers. These amazing organizations got together and developed what is referred to as a global agenda. And again, this global agenda is constantly reviewed and enhanced. And the focus of that global agenda has been focusing on key social problems within human relationships, our human reactions, how we impact each other, including human trafficking. These are just some of the areas that that global agenda has sought to address targeting factors related to susceptibility and as well as promoting collaborations. So some of the universal concerns that they have come across and sought to target were those family and gender based violence situations, as I mentioned earlier with, say, Virginia Locklear here in Robinson County, those intersections of rape, sexual assault, and human trafficking. As social workers, it is important for us to see the intersections between what we do across organizations and how human trafficking may present itself. Various forms of abuse. I appreciate the work that Polaris Project has done in, say, identifying um, say foster certain people who engage in foster parenting, specifically with the intent to traffic the individuals that they obtain into their households. So again, as social workers, we have been engaging in trainings and providing trainings to support each other to be able to better vet individuals. So we are not creating so-called carers who are part of these various human trafficking systems. Okay, and then also addressing international migration. Migration happens for many issues, right? Major conflicts, political instability. We are seeing that happen right now overseas, live and in person. Judy said this earlier, again, uh, major conflicts, political instability, natural disasters, that all creates vulnerability for human trafficking. So traffickers will go in and they will target. So we have to be aware of this as well as well as poor living and working conditions. So here are just some of the social work efforts, which are very much in alignment with what my colleagues have mentioned earlier throughout the, throughout the day during this conference. Collaborations are key. You have noticed when Christina Long was speaking regarding the North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission, you may have noticed she mentioned about how the commission includes people from, from all bodies of knowledge. That is critical because it's not just one group, it's not just one profession that can address this issue. We need to be able to target it from all angles. We need to engage in migration support. And of course, there's training for us as social workers to learn more about the contributing factors to migration, um, the response, as well as the trauma related to migration as well. Because oftentimes there's a lack of cultural competency, uh, cultural sensitivity and humility, humility when it relates to migration issues. In other words, attempting to kind of force people to be like, who you are versus still honoring 
their culture, et cetera. So job empowerment is important and supporting individuals in finding safe and decent jobs that provide them security and livable wages. Another one of those social work efforts is in regards to health and social services. Like I mentioned earlier, implementing strategies that confront health disparities, social service disparities, and access to these particular services. Overall, it is critical to develop methods to create access, equitable access to care. Policy advocacy, again, critical part of social work, enhancing the infrastructure of communities. Of course, we know our geographic location can affect our access to services, our access to care, our access to, to, to livable wage jobs. So considering what can we do within our communities to enhance the infrastructure. This part, this next one is key for people like me and Judy, that classroom training, right? That personnel training. We are in professions where our um, students truly need to know what this looks like. They need to know what this looks like. They need to know about awareness, intervention, prevention, and and how to respond trauma informed practice they need to know the policies so it is important for us to continue to enhance curricula to write and publish articles publish books and engage in opportunities such as this human trafficking conference today to share this information and train up the next leg of professionals to have more strength in responding and then this was mentioned earlier, and this is one of the most salient points of my presentation as well, as part of the social work efforts is recognizing the critical importance of survivors. Even myself over the past two years, I have been collaborating with, with a survivor of human trafficking, and I have enjoyed our relationship and even she has given me so much insight. So I'm thankful that she feels comfortable even sharing aspects of her story with me. But like it says, our survivors are our leaders. So when we are developing services, it is critical. Even with me now, as I develop my presentations, it is critical for me to be able to sit with someone. And even if I attempt to retell someone's story, I should have permission before I retell that story or to gain insights from them of what do you think is important that I share? So those are just some of the social work efforts that I wanted to be able to highlight for you today. Now I'm drawn to a close and this is my, one of my last slides and I just have a few closing thoughts. There are a couple of articles that I co-authored, as I mentioned earlier, it's also important for me to train up other social workers, other counseling professionals about this. So these are just a couple of my efforts. One author is titled Domestic Minor Sex trafficking practice implications for mental health professionals and the other is titled commercial sexual exploitation of adolescents gender specific and trauma informed care implications my colleagues you see noted are either faculty members here at uncp or i believe faculty members at liberty university and in closing just like i opened with i have the national human trafficking hotline very important to memorize, just as Judy said, she memorized this several years prior, right? And also the text number. There are many uh, organizations posted in the chat, and I encourage everyone to please reach out, whether you feel there is trafficking happening to someone you know. Uh, like Barbara said, she may not, she was not initially aware that this is what it was called that what she was going through and even to find out that it was still taking place be able to reach out um, to some of these safe places so with that i just thank you for this time i thank you for the invitation to present today judy and i'm going to turn it back over to you Oh, Veronica, I can't thank you enough. And you introduced me to your survivor. I've learned so much from her. She's been a wonderful resource. But I just want to tell you, I'm, I'm not only a lawyer, but I have a BSW. 
Yes. <laughs> I no one knows that because I always I, I know we never put that down, but I but before I went to law school and graduate school, I have my PSW. So yeah, another fellow social service. worker on the front lines, as I call it. There you go. There you go. Thank you so much for thank you so much, Dr. Hardy. Absolutely. So, so finally, the last academic response we're going to have is from my house guest, Professor Mace Bernashevitz. I don't I don't know if I said it right. He's from the University of Silesia in Katowice, Poland. Uh, in the last couple of, um, I guess, since February and Russia attacked Ukraine, um, Professor Maciej has been one of the friends of ours in Poland who has been instrumental in helping us uh, re relocate, relocate families from Ukraine who had to leave. These are uh, single women with children. Uh, he was very helpful in helping one family and uh, we're, we helped another family get to Warsaw but it was our colleagues in Poland, thanks to Dr. Mario Peperosi, my husband. He's been going to Poland for about 10 years. I've been going for about five years. And the Polish people are truly the most wonderful people in the world. Dr. Hardy, I thank you again. Uh, everything you do in this area has been wonderful. Uh, but let me just tell you a little bit about Professor Mace. So uh, he is a program director for art therapy. Oh, he's a criminologist, first and foremost. But he's also the degree program director for art therapy, pedagogy, special education, early school education, and preschool education. He's an author of over 90 peer reviewed journal articles in the field of sociology of culture and criminology, like uh, treatment methods and corrections, delinquency, penal policy, et cetera. He's written four books in Polish, but I only have the English title because he will tell you my Polish is terrible. Um, Young people in pop culture, world. View discourses, reception, and resistance. Another one is symbolic interactionism in the theory and practice of correctional treatment. Um, an interesting title, title one, a yuppie and a squatter, global lifestyles in the local educational environments. And he co-authored with his wife, who is the most be the beautiful Monica, of course, Bernashevitz, on family life and crime. They're both wonderful professors, and he will speak about Europe's response to human trafficking. Welcome, doctor. I'm going to call you um, Professor Mace because your last name really gets me. Thank you for coming and speaking. Mace, uh, let me unmute you. Okay. Ready? I can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Hold on, it's not working. Okay, you should be unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Judy, for your introduction, for in your invitation. Uh, I'm very pleased to be among you uh, in your beautiful country. I'm here for nine days, so I come back on Friday. Thank you very much. I I'm, I'm want to talk about uh, Bulgaria, Romania, and uh, Poland today. Oh, uh, uh, see my presentation, yes? Yes. Oh, okay. So, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, and uh, partly Poland, countries from, uh, and countries from the former uh, Soviet Union, as known as the main countries of origin of, for victims and trafficking and labor exploitation in Europe, Therefore, much focus in these countries is still put on national traffic. Uh, much less attention has been paid to addressing and preventing labor exploitation between countries own board. Uh, Bulgaria, uh, it's country uh, uh, which victims have been trafficked in the years uh, 2011 to 2017 include Germany, Greece, Netherlands, Austria, France, Cyprus, Poland, Italy and Czech Republic. According to Eurostat, it's also one of the five EU member states where the highest number of identified victims of human trafficking in Europe originate from. Okay. According to the Bulgarian Prosecutor's Office, over a half thousand people were identified and registered as trafficked, including, first of all, females and primarily sexual exploitation. Only a small number of these cases were identified and occurred with within uh, Bulgaria. Uh, in 
2017, the national agency against human trafficking registered six uh, over 600 identified victims of human trafficking. Uh, a similar uh, over uh, a half thousand women, uh, and uh, it was uh, primarily sexually exploited exploitation. The majority of these victims were exploited abroad, not in Romania. Poland is, uh, of course, Poland, of course, criminalizes uh, uh, trafficking, human trafficking. Poland's penal code prescribes punishment of three to uh, 15 years imprisonment. Uh, police in Poland registered in uh, 2019 only 31 crimes that have been that have been cleared and solved by arrest and 98 victims. Why this figure is so low? I think the Polish police uh, classify uh, this crime as a different uh, category. For example, uh, uh, slavery as a fraud. Uh, 82 people in comparison to 16 Polish citizens it should be noted that among the victims, the majority are men. In 2019, the vast majority of the victims were people exploited in work and forced services. At the same time, significantly fewer cases concern exploitation for prostitution. The border guard at the next law enforcement authority identified uh, uh, 98 potential victims of trafficking in human beings in 2019 in Poland. 80 people were forced into forced uh, labor and um, first of all, citizens of Ukraine. Uh, when we, when you, uh, I, I want to show you a, a, a map. Poland is a country of origin. We can see uh, the green line uh, on the graph, uh, transfer, yellow line or and destination for victims of human trafficking, for victims from beyond the Eastern border, especially Ukraine, Bulgaria, Romania, and Belarus. Due to increasing economic growth in Poland and demand for foreign workers, the government has been more open to welcoming migrants from Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, Russia, Armenia, and Georgia, as well as from Asian countries, such as Vietnam. Poland has been particularly accepting of migrants workers from former Soviet Union countries and more recently also from Asia. In 2017, the Minister of Labor revealed that immigration had increased by uh, 35%, mostly due to Ukrainian migrants. Over 1 million Ukrainians currently work in Poland, mainly on contemporary uh, visas. I, of course, uh, mm, in the past weeks, uh, we were welcoming additional 2 million people. So, uh, current non official estimates about the number of Ukrainian migrants residing in the country uh, between 1 of 2 million people. And we uh, summarize with this, uh, this uh, number uh, from a few weeks from the past. It could be nowadays uh, 4 million people. Ukrainian migrants who work illegally are exposed to additional consequences of accidents at work. In May 2020, a high profile court trial ended in Poland regarding the death of a 36 year old Ukrainian who fainted at work. According to the prosecutor's office, the boss of Ukrainian worker forbade to call for help due, due to illegal informal employment. As a result of this omission, the employee has died and the boss took the main body to the forest. The employer was sentenced to almost two years in prison. When, it, when we talk about, about combating, combating and preventing trafficking, there are many institutions in Poland uh, uh, which deal with this phenomenon. Um, uh, the most important is Minister of Interior uh, Administration, the police, of course, the border guard, but uh, a significant role in the fight against human trafficking in Poland is, uh, um, is played the Na National Consulting Intervention Center for the Victims of Trafficking, KCIK. This center, this center is financed by competition of the, by the Ministry of the Interior of Administration. KCIK offers 
uh, a hotline, yes, basic, uh, who guarantee basic provision, food, clothes, shoes, sanitary products, accommodation in, in a safe place, psychological support, legal assistance, the assistance of an interpreter, medical assistance. After identifying the victims, KCIK okay, employees have the opportunity to isolate her or his from the perpetrators in the shelter and provide them with a comprehensive uh, support. At the request of the ministry, the KCIK program has been implemented in the recent years by two non-governmental organizations. The choice of these NGOs is not accidental as they are visible in Polish media and have been dealing with the issue of trafficking in human beings for many years. I'm talking about the Foundation Against Trafficking in Human Beings and Slavery, La Strada, and the Catholic support organization, POMOTS. La Strada, together with POMOTS, runs KCIK, which is actually financed by the Minister of the Interior through a tender process that the government launches annually. La Strada, Poland, runs a shelter in Warsaw. POMOTS has, has a shelter in Katowice. NGOs POMOS is run by nuns from the congregation of Sister of Mary Immaculate, who aims, among other things, to care for poor women and to prevent prostitution. 20 years ago, the congregation delegated two sisters to work with the prostitutes, who today, together with the staff or lay therapists, run a center for victims of trafficking in human beings and prostitutes who want to leave the profession. The nuns also acquired qualification to conduct therapy, addiction treatment, for example, the shelter, the shelter accepts women, with, some with children, who may stay in the center for a period no longer than nine months. Sometimes this period is expanded. As they say in the book they recently published, uh, quoted, for someone who really wants to, nine months is really enough. Our experience showed that when you stay here for a long time, people simply do not feel good. Prevalences, convenience, claims are triggered. Unquoted. In the book they publish, the sisters share their experiences, but most of all, they give voice to the women they helped. I want to uh, cite uh, a, a fragment when we can also find a description of the sisters' work with the victims. Quoted, I went to a client I had visited before and uh, whom I knew was a policeman. He once told me he would help me if I wanted to. I already never returned there. She talks about uh, brothel. The policeman took me to my mother and told me not to go out. After a few hours, a policeman came who listened to the whole story and called the right place. When she hung up, she told me to pack. An hour later, I was on my way to crisis intervention center in another city. It was hard to leave everything behind. Everything that is drugs, fun, alcohol, expensive cosmetics, fashionable clothes. After a few days at the crisis intervention center, I found out that there was a place for me in a sheltered center run by nuns. Well, I wasn't pleased. In a place like this, I thought one had to pray a lot and there was no question of any drugs. I thought I will go and when then I will run away. The police drove me to the shelter. Upon my arrival, I spoke to the sisters about the rules of the house. Of course, they invited those willing to pray. When I thought that I had better go if they were to prosecute me afterwards for not going to pray. They also presented their entire assistance offer and I only asked how much it would cost. cost. When they said nothing at all, I started asking wh where the catch was. It seems, me, it seems to me that nothing was for free in life. I talked a lot with my sister about my life, about my desires. I took part in various activities. Surprisingly, I didn't run away, although at first I was only because I was scared. Area escapes always ended very badly. The initial two years in the center were difficult for me. I was afraid of every sound, light, fast movement. I was constantly awake. I was nervous that my previous torturers would find me. However, the sister and staff were patient. They helped me find a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist who supported me. Meanwhile, Sister Anna gained my trust. She talked to me a lot. She was so human. I had the impression that she was not rejecting anyone and accepting people as they are. It gave me more warmth than I have experienced in my whole life. We had a weekly ritual every week. We went on trips to IKEA. We always walked around the store. We talked. 
In the end, we were buying ice cream. I loved our trips. One sister, Anna, took me to the, her lecture. She was talking about girls working on the street. She did it with such kindness. She did not judge. And I cried as a baby. I felt that someone understood me. Kasia, who worked in the centers as a case manager and therapist, also had a big influence on my shift. She helped me cope with my, my miscarriage, which I had a few years ago. It was a subject that I could not come to terms with. Kasia took me for walks with her dog. Then we talked a lot. She once persuaded me to write a letter. I included everything in it. My drugs, my miscarriage. Kasia went with me to, talk to the park and supported me while I, I, I was smoking this letter. It was an important moment for me. I don't know how it happened, but after 70 years of drug use, I stopped. After many years, I went to confession. I felt free and happy. I also attended an addiction consultation. There, there they started that I did not need any other support for now. I started to pay to get to know life sober. It was beautiful. I started to feel joy and it turned out that I was surrounded by only good people. The bow fragment shows the typical fate of victims of sexual violence, I think. We also see that breaking up with the past means hiding from torturers and starting a long recovery process. Being a victim of sexual abuse is often associated with addiction and mental disorders. People who have time to build a bond of friendship and trust with the victims of violence must participate in the recovery process. Their professional therapeutic education, but also all their readiness to accompany the victims in everyday life, activities, shopping, walks, talks, builds the right space to start a new life by a victim of sexual violence. While in Bulgaria and Romania, sexual exploitation uh, is predominant among the victims identified, forced labor is predominant in Poland, I think. Eastern European countries have legal and institutional measures to combat trafficking in human beings, like proper law and enforcement. However, NGOs play a special role in the system of counteracting the negative phenomena of forced labor and sexual exploitation. The state is, the state is persuading the perpetrators, but the victims are usually assisted by NGOs. And uh, finally, I want to show you the picture. It's uh, meeting with the former ambassador of the United States of America, Georgette Mosbacher, with staff of one of these NGOs, what I uh, spoke. Uh, La Strada. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for coming all the way from Poland to present at UNC Pembroke, uh, Professor Maciej. And La Strada is one of the best NGOs uh, in absolutely in Europe and has been responding to human trafficking for about 20 years. So I'm so happy that you mentioned La Strada. So I want to thank everybody for attending the virtual conference. The, the compliments are just unbelievable. Uh, thank you so much. Anybody who wants to get a hold of us, Please just email me. I've posted it a few times, Judith Paparozzi at uncp.edu. I want to personally thank uh, my university. I can't believe how supportive my university has been right from the beginning of this work of, of ours, Dr. Hardy, and other. The, the support we get is unbelievable. Um, but from my chancellor, Chancellor Cummings, to uh, Dean Gay, to my associate dean, Ashley Allen, who gave a wonderful introduction today. And uh, just she was just fabulous to her staff for the enormous help putting this all together. For James Lewis, Marquita, and Durant for keeping the technology going, you are awesome. For my department chair, Dr. Porter Lewis, my previous chair, my husband, Dr. Mario Paparuzzi, and his phenomenal assistant, Shannon Maynard. I couldn't do it all these years, I couldn't have done it without Shannon. To my speakers, I thank you both for your service here today and also for being my dear friend and colleagues. I thank Congressman Smith for that wonderful video and his work fighting human trafficking. I just can't believe how he is such a wonderful guy. But mostly I wanna thank the over 1800 students of mine who have taken human trafficking over the last 12 years and have, have gotten involved in, its, in the work or volunteer, Susan Romano is now volunteering for ATI. Uh, Susan worked for Christine. I know there are other ones I'm forgetting, I'm sorry. I feel like it's, I'm at the Oscars right now and trying to remember to thank everybody. But I tell my students at the beginning of the, con of the class, and somebody asked me for the name of the class, it's Human Trafficking and Slavery, and it's always offered online, uh, somebody who asked for that. Um, I tell my students every semester, 
this is the hardest class you'll ever love. And they don't understand it. That's an old Peace Corps expression. This is the hardest job you'll ever love. By the end of the semester, and I think at the end of this conference, you all understand why this conference may be the hardest conference you'll ever love, like my class is the hardest class you'll ever love. And remember, think fair trade, and we'll see you next year at my sixth annual human trafficking conference. And hopefully it'll be both in person and virtual. And of course, let's all be a part of ending all forms of modern day slavery. Thank you so much. The, the chat was great. You guys were so supportive and we'll see you next year.